TikTok, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. Your friendly neighborhood philosopher, D-Wood. Look at this. We're only three minutes late. And people are complaining. Guys, that is way, way less late than I am with AP. I'm always on time. Yeah. The, the, uh, yeah. We were on time. We were just pulling up a bunch of passages that we might want to use <laughs> mm -hmm. to show how dumb this video is. <laughs> oh, I got plenty. We, oh, we, are gonna sh we are gonna prove Muhammad is in other places in the Bible using the same standard the Muslims use. And uh, if you've been living on a desert island somewhere and have no idea who I'm with now, this is the, uh, the mighty inspiring philosophy, Mike Jones. We got Mike Jones in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, he's gotta show love to all his fans cause without his fans, he wouldn't be that man. He's Mike Jones. Who? <laughs> that was weak, man. We gotta we gotta <laughs> tighten it up. <laughs> I'm white. What do you want? <laughs> Mike Jones, and like five minutes later, who? <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, why don't you why don't you set up this video for us? Because you've been over on TikTok, and and the way I have viewed TikTok for a while is uh, over on YouTube. We've been responding to arguments for years, and it takes a long, long time to make progress, but there is progress. So for mm -hmm. a long time, the argument was uh, the perfect preservation of the Quran is miraculous. You can go to any two Quran manuscripts anywhere in all of history. They, they, they match dot for dot, letter for letter, perfect match, not one letter's difference between any two Qurans ever. They now acknowledge that that was a lie the entire time. It was a lie according to their own sources, which talk about entire chapters coming up missing and all sorts of disagreements among Muhammad's top guys. It's uh, a lie according to the manuscript tradition. It's a lie according to uh, the different kirat, the different versions of the Quran that they use in different parts of the world today, which have different words, different letters, and so on. Uh, so that was a lie, but now they're starting to acknowledge it's a lie. It takes two decades of us telling them that it's a lie before they acknowledge that it's a lie, but they eventually acknowledge that it's a lie. Um, then you had the the scientific miracles of the Quran. The Quran is filled with miraculous scientific knowledge that couldn't have been known by Muhammad except for divine inspiration. Then we spent 20 years explaining that that's a lie, that the Quran's a mm -hmm. scientific catastrophe. <laughs> And now they finally acknowledge, even, uh, even Ali Dawa says that it, the scientific miracles argument is, in his words, absolute nonsense. Those are his words, absolute nonsense. It was his words. And um, I pointed out recently that the argument for Muhammad in the Bible would seem to be the next thing that's going to go. But this one's a bit more difficult for them to let go of because perfect preservation of the Quran, that's not exact. I mean, you've got... You know, you've got verses like Surah 15, 9 of the Quran, which make it sound like Allah is going to protect his revelations and so on. Um, but you don't get some argument from perfect preservation like this is going to be the proof. Uh, the Quran doesn't say, you know, the Quran's miraculous scientific knowledge is going to be the proof. But the Quran does claim that there are prophecies in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> that show that Muhammad was a true prophet. And so this one is a bit more difficult for them to give up on because now they have to they have to acknowledge that the Quran is wrong about this. So uh, why don't you so uh, I anyway, I viewed TikTok when I see TikTok. I view it as like we've made progress on YouTube that now certain arguments are being abandoned. But whenever I hear from TikTok, they're using one of the arguments that mm -hmm. have already been destroyed over on YouTube. And it seems like they're, yep. they're targeting a younger audience with the same nonsense because the younger audience hasn't been exposed to the refutations. That's what it looks like to me. But what's your impression? Because you're way, I've only seen a couple TikTok videos oh, ever. It's a dumpster fire. They're, they're, they're still trying to argue that Mecca's in Psalm 84, which is ridiculous beyond ridiculous. Uh, oh. But this- But wait, it says Becca. It says Becca. That, that's <laughs> almost like Mecca. Mecca, oh, Becca, exactly. Becca, Mecca. Oh, yeah, Come no. on, dude. How, I mean, how much proof do you need? Yeah. <laughs> well, the good news is we're making progress on, on this area because for years we've been told the name the, is, is in the Song of Solomon. The Muhammad's name is in Song of Solomon. There's a book 
written Muhammad foretold in the Bible by name. I mean, Akhmedida was saying this 10 years ago, 10, 20 years ago. I forget when he passed away, but he's mentioned by name in Song of Solomon 516. So I did a short video showing how this is just grammatically not possible. It, the uh, word is in plural. There's You don't make names plural up to show respect in Hebrew. So the name is, if, if it's a name, it would be a plural, saying there's multiple Muhammads. But also in Song of Solomon 516, there's a word right before it that means all or every. So it's a literal plural. It'd be saying there are multiple Muhammads if this is his actual name. Muslims, of course, lost their mind and they started coming out. No, well, that's not really the argument. The argument was not that his name is there. Yes, it was. That is the, that was exactly the argument. In fact, that there was are, the there. first that was the first argument I ever that specifically. Song yeah. of Solomon 516 was the first argument I ever read for Islam. It was in a Muslim track. I still have that track somewhere. Someone gave it to me in prison. Um, mm -hmm. And and it was where I went and looked. I went and looked in just, I just had a Strong's Concordance. I went and looked in the Strong's Concordance. I looked up the word. Then I looked up other places where the word was used. And I'm like, this is all wrong. So that was actually the first argument I was given. Is this one you're talking about now? Then the first like full full blown argument I got from a Muslim was he uh, uh, the imam there sat me down and, and showed me this video on scientific miracles in the Quran. <laughs> But um, it, it's the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, this video that we're about to watch actually reminds me of the scientific um, miracles video I watched in that they would just say a bunch of stuff rapid fire so that people who aren't really paying attention don't realize this has nothing to do with anything you're saying right now. Nothing yeah, you're saying, pro nothing you're saying proves your point at all. Again, I was watching videos like 10 years ago that Muslims sent to me from like Ahmed Didat or Zakir Knight saying that Muhammad is mentioned by name in the Song of Solomon. I mean, there's that book that was the argument told in the Bible by name. And they say literally it's being used as a proper noun in Song of Solomon 516. When you show that's nonsense, now the argument changes. So Muslims are sort of having to restructure their arguments now. Because, so they still say the passage is about Muhammad with the most convoluted hoops ever. But at least now they're admitting that it's not a proper noun in Song of Solomon 516. So progress. And so I'm happy to announce to everyone out there, we're making very little progress in these horrible arguments and showing how bad they are. But at least they're now admitting Mahmadim is not literally a proper noun. So progress. Yeah. And that the reason they would admit that is because we spent uh, we spent a lot of time. Matter of fact, we'll probably bring it up uh, at some point as we're watching this video. Um, we went through other places in the Bible where the word yep. is used, where Mahmud is used. And if you want to say this is Muhammad, it's not looking good for Muhammad because God promises to desecrate, <laughs> to desecrate well, Mahmud. They're now basically arguing that Mahmudim is just a hint to his name or it's just foreshadowing. It's just like a wordplay, I guess, kind of thing, which we'll see in the video. But if that's the case, then it's then we could do this in other places. Mahmud uh, just is the same thing. It's just a hint to Muhammad in mm -hmm. other places where it's being desecrated and destroyed. That's so, exactly that's exactly where we will soon be going in this live stream. If it's a hint of Muhammad here, because the word <laughs> sort of sounds like Muhammad, then it's a hint of what God's going to do to Muhammad over in these other it's just, places. It's like they're shooting themselves in the foot. If they want to have a consistent uh, hermeneutic, they need to say it's also a hint to his name in other places. But they won't do that because it would make Muhammad look bad. But, you know, it's all about the agenda, not about a consistent hermeneutic. Yeah, so, and the the real methodology, the real methodology is always whatever we can use to defend Muhammad, that's what we'll use to defend Muhammad. And it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, that's the rule. That's the guiding principle. Well, when we get to later, I will prove beyond a shadow of doubt that Muhammad is prophesied in Numbers 22 with the uh, with the whole event of Balaam, which we'll get to that later. But I will use the same hermeneutic the Muslims are using to show that he is clearly in that passage. Okay, so just to recap, just to recap, people may get the feeling when they're interacting with Muslim arguments that they're not making a difference. That, hey, I explained this to this guy 75 different times in 75 different ways, and he's still not getting how insane this argument sounds. 
And there is a there's a tendency to think this is a waste of time. I'm wasting my time. I mean, I can offer all these different refutations to show that this argument is insane <laughs> and completely wrong and demonstrably false. And they'll just keep spitting it out more and more and more. And they'll run to different platforms. Oh, it's been refuted on YouTube. Let me go to TikTok. Use the same exact argument. So it seems like we don't make progress. But if you look at it over a period of, you know, a decade, two decades you see the the refutations do eventually sink in and then they either you abandon see? they either abandon the argument like they like they're now doing with the scientific miracles and with the perfect preservation or in this case they'll modify it they'll come up with the 2.0 the 2.0 okay yeah that <laughs> other argument that was dumb that was a dumb argument that was all wrong but now i got the new argument and i'm going to put a bunch of stuff up on the screen and everyone's going to think that i made great points cuz they're not paying attention oh we're paying attention we're going to take a look uh -huh. All right, so should we uh, jump into this video? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, it's about seven minutes long. There, there's one part we could kind of mention, because in the beginning, he just kind of makes the same point over and over again. So maybe we could skip some of that and move it up a little bit. But we No, we're watching it all. We, we, we don't want to run the risk of, of someone thinking. We, we don't want someone thinking, ah, if you just, if you didn't skip through the first Fair minute, enough. that's where he really made his powerful <laughs> point. Yeah, go for it. I, I yeah, the, yeah, the, the context defense. Ah, you left out the context. It's like one of the one of the main uh, main uh, arguments whenever All right. they get refuted. Now, just to be clear, I recall some guy saying before, and he he took he took the part. Hang on, he took the part from uh, I think chapter one. Let me see. Yep, you're right. You know, dark like the, the dark. Wait, that's the same guy. <laughs> Where it says dark like the tents of Kedar, and and he said, "You see, that's that's Muhammad. This is Muhammad, and, and you had to point out that this is the woman speaking." Is that the same guy? Yeah, I wasn't gonna bring it up, but yeah, it's him. Oh my goodness! So so we're so we're dealing with someone who jumps into it, decides ahead of time that this is Muhammad, looks for yeah. anything that could be used to say that it's Muhammad, yeah. even if he's going to the wrong passages because these are the he goes to the passages where the woman is speaking. But he saw uh, Kadar. Anytime you see Kadar, that's that that means Muhammad. Any because that's the only thing that ever happened uh, with Kadar, <laughs> and doesn't realize it's the woman speaking. Yep, same guy. Same yeah. guy. Okay, so we're yeah we're dealing with the top brass over on TikTok. That's what <laughs> that's what I'm hearing. I it's just it's I knew you'd enjoy this. This is gonna be fun. All right, so let's go, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to check out. Uh... <laughs> Here we go. The audio is a little distorted that uh, uh, at the very beginning when he's playing the clip of you, uh, yeah. you, just so everyone knows that is that is only at the beginning when he's playing a clip of uh, of inspiring philosophy. Um, so that is not on my end. That is in the actual video. Let's take a look. Over the past several months, I've been tagged in a number of videos of Muslims claiming that Song of Solomon 516 predicts the coming of Muhammad. But this is utter nonsense. So this video does not address the prophecy or the argument in the Song of Songs, but he only focuses on verse 16 and whether the word Muhammadim is meant to be a name or not, which is an older formulation of the argument. <laughs> so uh, shame, shame on shame on Mike Jones. He's focusing on the by far most popular version of the argument, the only one exactly. that many, the only one that many of us were familiar with uh, after decades of dealing with Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik and Shabir Ali <laughs> and a bunch of other people using the exact same argument, namely yep. in in chapter five, verse sixteen of Song of Solomon, it says in the trans in the typical translation, he is altogether lovely, but the word there is Mahmadim, and Mahmadim sounds like Muhammad, kind of sounds like Muhammad. They commit the font, what's called the phonic fallacy. Oh, these words sound alike, therefore it's referring to the same thing. And they used this because they were talking to people who had no idea how to refute it. They had people had no idea how to respond to this fallacy. People had no idea that this word is used in, in, in multiple places in the Old Testament. It makes no sense to translate these as Muhammad, but people didn't know it. It was an argument meant to deceive ignorant people. You re so he's, he's saying shame on you for responding to that extremely popular argument. Yeah, and I was getting tagged in people posting photos on TikTok of them saying, Muhammad mentioned my name in Song of Solomon 516. And like this is over the past several months. So finally, I was like, let me just sit down with this guy. I know that I'm hopefully going to help teach me Hebrew over the next several months. 
And like, look, let's look at this. And he's like, this is nonsense because it's just plural. The, the word right before it means all or every. So I was like, yeah, I'll just do a quick video on that. And of course, Muslims lost their mind, changed the argument, present 2.0 version, which is is equally as bad. It's, it's uh, at least it's, it's at least as bad. Yeah, it's, it's equally bad, just in different ways, because it's as I pointed out on TikTok, you're you're just reading Islamic theology into the text and then you're using this passage to argue for Islam. So it's like Jay Dyer said in his debate with Daniel Higachu, it's arguing in a circle. That's mm -hmm. all it is. And it's, uh, I mean, there are, there are multiple issues here, um, just, just the concept. So the Quran says that we find Muhammad mentioned in the Torah and the Gospel. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. So why are you guys going to Song of Solomon 5, 16? So why are you going to Song of Solomon at all? Torah and the Gospel. It yep. seems they must they must have a much broader concept of Torah to where it means entire Old Testament or something like that, which is fine with me. So now you've now you've got your stamp of approval, Muslims, on the entire Old Testament. But if that's what Allah means when He says the Torah, if when Allah says the Torah, He just means old entire Old Testament. Then great. When Allah says the Gospel, we should assume that He means entire New Testament. And we can't ignore the fact that you are the guys who say uh, nonstop, all day, every day, Bible's been corrupted, and you can't stop going to the Bible for confirmation. But this is interesting. So, guys, keep in mind, this is not the Torah as far as the five books of Moses. This is not the Gospel. You're going somewhere other than the Torah and the Gospel and declaring that Song of Solomon is the inspired word of Allah. So just, just keep in mind, the rest of the Old Testament is the inspired word of of Allah. And Lorraine here po points out, uh, this is the phonic fallacy, I mentioned that. Um, mm -hmm. But we've pointed out multiple problems with that, like uh, uh, Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Well, Akbar, I mean, now they're saying... Akbar, Akbar in Hebrew is mouse. So when they say Allahu Akbar, they're saying Allah is a mouse, if they want to stick with the phonic fallacy. Well, I mean, now they're saying that it's not his actual name in the passage. So, yeah. progress, so that is, that I mean, is yeah. good. Yeah. Finally, finally. I've been wanting Muslims to say this for years. Finally. Like, Thank you. This is why we're doing the stream. You're finally admitting it. Mm -hmm. uh, Cedric here says, uh, IP and AP sound the same. So AP is actually Christian like we suspected all along. I think, I he's, making fun, I think, I think he's making fun of the argument here. <laughs> like, oh, it sounds the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, they sound exactly the same. In fact, if I weren't looking at the screen right now, I would think that I'm with AP right now. Mm -hmm. um, oh, maybe he's just talking about your names, IP and AP. IP and I, mm. IP, AP, IP, AP, they sound the same. Therefore, uh, IP uh, is AP and AP, you're a Christian, so AP is a Christian. That's uh, airtight reasoning and exactly the sort of reasoning we get from uh, from our Dawah friends. All right, uh -huh. so should we, w should we continue this one? Go for it. So what did we get so far? Shame on you. You're responding to the older version of the argument and not the new version <laughs> that they're making up as they go along. Exactly. Okay, let's get let's get some powerful stuff. But before we get into it, I want to dispel the myth that modern apologists and thinkers have perpetuated that the Song of Songs is not allegorical, it's not prophetic, and it's nothing more than a love poem between two lovers. This couldn't be further from the truth, and it stands at odds with virtually all tradition, Jewish and Christian alike, the New Testament itself, and other intertextual references. Wait, what? Hang on, let me go back. Yeah. He said virtu virtually all. See, if he had said, hey, there have been lots of Jews and lots of Christians who interpret this allegorically, I would have granted that, but it sounded like he said virtually all. He did, yeah, see. virtually let all. Let me see yeah. what he hears. Two lovers. This couldn't be further from the truth, and it stands at odds with virtually all tradition, Jewish and Christian alike, the New Testament <laughs> itself. All right. <laughs> this is what I mean. If he had just said, hey, there have been lots of Christians and lots of Jews who interpret this allegorically, I would have said, okay. When he says virtually all, now you sound like you don't know what you're talking about. And mm -hmm. and this is this is not something that I have studied anywhere near in depth. The only reason I've studied any of this is from interacting with Muslims who are saying that this is about Muhammad and Song of Solomon. Mm -hmm. And I know that what he just said is completely false. And so even though his, it, but notice anyone who's familiar with this would know, OK, he just exposed himself as not knowing what he's talking about. His fans do not know that he just exposed himself as not knowing what he's talking about. So these are always meant to appeal to the ignorant. 
Yeah, yeah. And I mean, like, if you look, I believe it's an ESV study Bible, they note within the past like 100 years, the overwhelming majority of scholars interpret this as just a love poem. Like, that's what it is, like, that, at its base. Now, Christians throughout the centuries have reinterpreted it as this allegory of uh, God's love for Israel or Jesus' love for the church, but that's typology. That's not actually what the text is about. When you do typology, you already have a set theology that you read on top of the text, which you can do. I'm not saying it's wrong for Christians or Jews to do typology. The problem is, is you can't then use that typology as evidence for your religion. So if Muslims want to do typology on Song of Solomon, fine, do it. But that, that you then can't turn around and say that that typology I've read into the text is therefore evidence for my religion, because that's arguing in a circle. That's not actually evidence for Islam if you just read Islam into the text. And sure, Christians do typology with the text. I've never denied that. I didn't say it was wrong. But again, that's a typology. Know the difference. That's not what the text is actually explicitly saying. Um, you mentioned uh, ESV, study Bible. So I'm here on theme, title, and interpretation. Uh, it says the song, uh, we, we, need to, we need everyone to understand what he's responding to here. So when you read Song of Solomon, it's, uh, I mean, there, there are disagreements about uh, how many characters there are. So is it the shepherd, the woman, and Solomon, and the chorus? Or is Solomon mm, the shepherd? So when it says shepherd, it's referring to Solomon, and therefore it's, it's just Solomon and the woman and uh, this chorus. Um, so you have some, some differences like that. Then you have a, a difference of view on whether this is one cohesive story. This is one story in eight chapters, or is this a collection of separate poems that were all kind of put together? You have disagreements like that, but yeah. the, the big one would be, it sounds like you and I read it at least mainly as this is a, a poem this is a love poem between a uh, <coughs> yeah, uh, between yeah. between a man and a woman, and that's how we're reading it. And so the allegorical interpretation would be, um, yes, there's that there, but it's really about it's really about God's love for the nation of Israel or Christ's love for the church. And it seems that this arose just because people in the past were a little uncomfortable having such overtly sexual sexualized content in the, you know, in the middle of the Bible. And so, oh, it's talking about this, this, you know, really graphic content here. Is this, is this uh, just that? Is this just about, you know, uh, sexual attraction between a man and a woman? No, it must be, it must be something, it must be something different. So there was a tendency to say, ah, this represents God's love for Israel or, or something like well, that. Here's what Tremper Longman says in his commentary on Song of Solomon. He says, though allegory does appear in the Hebrew Bible, it is clear from our definition and example that the Song of Songs is not an allegory. The book itself has no signals that it is to be read in any other way than a love song. No one can dispute this fact. However, this ob observation does not end the discussion. Even though the song is not an allegory as such, it has been the object of an allegorical interpretation from the beginning of recorded commentary on the book. So he says, look, there is nothing in the book that suggests this is an allegory. It's a love poem, but people have come along and they have reinterpreted it as an allegory, which again, you can do, but mm -hmm. you then can't use that reinterpretation as evidence for your religion. That's arguing in a circle. Yeah. So everyone needs to follow what, what he's saying there. So we're, we're reading this as, as love poetry. You have people want to say, ah, it's love poetry, but there's a deeper meaning here that represents this. That's fine. Mm -hmm. You can, you can tote, we both grant, you can view it that way. Uh, one, you can't use you looking for some deeper meaning as some sort of proof because you're reading that in there. You're, you're reading that into the text. You're saying this actually represents this other thing. So that's one issue. Uh, two, Another pro another problem is even if you want to go all allegorical, I still don't see what in the name of common sense this has to do with Muhammad. So in other words, if I look at this and I say this is allegorical of God's love for Israel or it's allegorical, um, it's actually about Christ's love for the church. What in the name of common sense does it have to do with Muhammad either way? So in other words, <laughs> if this is just love poetry, 
What does it have to do with Muhammad? If it's an allegory, what does it have to do with Muhammad? I see no indication ever, even slightly, that this has anything to do oh. with Muhammad. We'll get to that at the end, because that's what he's going to try it when he goes through these big examples of noting that Christians and Jews interpreted it allegorically, which, again, the first half of this video is a waste of time because he just points out they've interpreted it allegorically, which we accept. But again, yeah. the scholarship is quite clear on this today. It's a love poem. Yeah. That's just what the overwhelming majority of scholars now say. Let me, uh, let me read just a couple sentences from uh, ESV Study Bible here. The Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, contains beautiful and sensuous poetry expressing romantic love between a young man and a young woman in ancient Israel. On this point, there is general agreement, but agreement ends once the discussion moves to how the Song of Solomon works to convey its theme. The Song of Solomon has, in fact, been uh, subject to a broader range of interpretations, probably, than any other book in the Bible. Thus, the Song of Solomon was first understood by early Jewish interpreters as an allegory of God's love for Israel, and then, through many centuries of Christian interpretation, as primarily an allegory of Christ's love for the Church, or as Christ's love for the soul. In contrast to this, most Christian interpreters since the 19th century, so the past couple centuries, most mm -hmm. Christian interpreters since the 19th century have understood the Song of Solomon as a beautifully crafted love poem describing either the relationship between King Solomon and his Shulamite bride, or two, the relationship between a simple shepherd and the Shulamite shepherdess, or three, a three-character relationship involving Solomon, a shepherd boy, and the Shulamite shepherdess. So, uh, notice what they're saying. Yes, way back in the day, uh, common to interpret this as an allegory, but since the 19th century, so the 1800s, since the 19th century, most interpreters in just interpret this as, as love poetry. Yeah, so, so you're, I mean, you're, Muslims you're, have to go out, out of date scholarship. They're, they take the consensus from hundreds of years ago as if it's the standard. Yeah. And ignore the fact that I'm coming from, like, again, the consensus of scholars today on this. So, like, what are you trying to do here? And, um, yeah, so th this just goes back to what, what I was mentioning, him saying virtually all, it, it makes it sound like no one interprets this <laughs> as just love poetry when that is the standard position since the 19th century. Yeah. All right. So should we, uh, let's go back yeah. to this video a bit. He's going to list a bunch of scholars that are, that, that say that it's an allegory, which fine. Again, I accept, but again, you can't argue in a circle is my main point. And so, uh, again, guys, don't forget our, <laughs> our thesis throughout here. It's either love poetry, in which case, what's it have to do with Muhammad? Or if you want to say it's allegorical, fine. As, as IP pointed out, you can't use that as an argument because that's, that's you, you know, coming, putting your interpretation there. Uh, or, or as I would say, if it's an allegory, what in the world does it have to do with Muhammad? I understand, I understand Jews interpreting this as God's love for Israel. I understand that. I understand Christians interpreting this as Christ's love for the church. I get that. I get I get that interpretation. I do not see what in the world any of this would have to do with Muhammad. Even, in other words, I could grant everything this guy's saying right now about this, this being allegorical. No idea what it has to do with Muhammad. Mm -hmm. But you're saying he's going to get to that, so. And other intertextual references. Let's begin with the works of Ellen F. Davis, an Old Testament expert and scholar. In her commentary on Song of Songs, she notes that, in a sense, the Songs is the most biblical of books. In her works, she remarks that if the modern commentators are correct that the Songs are nothing more than erotic poetry, then this is the biggest religious joke of all time. She points out that what is striking about the Songs, other than its erotic language, is that it is a mosaic of quotations from other parts of Scripture. Not just scattered words, but connected phrases, vivid images, and specific terms to their context that cannot be forgotten by those familiar with biblical language. She points out that modern commentators have not taken this phenomenon seriously enough and that we need an interpretation that takes into full account this remarkable scriptural resonance. And she urges that contemporary Christians and Jews need to interpret the Song of Songs as it was traditionally understood, namely as a mystical text. Um, yeah, here again, I, would, uh, I, would have, I wouldn't have a... Pr I don't think it's what the... <laughs> I don't think it is a mystical text. No. I and understand. Go ahead. I was going to say, well, first of all, uh, this is the problem with it is notice she's not a Muslim. So she obviously disagrees 
with how this guy reads it. So this is the problem with trying to make this an allegory. Everyone's going to interpret the metaphors differently and come at a wildly different theology. So like for her, for him to just cite her is actually working against his case because she's not going to say, yes, this is about Muhammad. She's going to say, no, the allegories refer to something else. And this is not the biggest religious joke. That's ridiculous because if it's love poetry, it's God basically saying, yes, include a book in the canon that celebrates sex in marriage as a good thing. That's a great thing. It's something I made that's good. It should not be rejected as, as something that's bad or only used for childbearing. It's actually a good thing you should celebrate. So don't you know, like stigmatize sex or to look down upon it. It's a good thing that should be celebrated. So it's not a big religious joke, I'd say. I'd say as a love poem, it, it should be in the canon for what it is and what it celebrates. Uh, and I would I would agree. Uh, it sounds like she's just old school in that. Ah, can I be talking about just sex in a holy book? That would be weird. Ah, that's got to be about something. Got to be about something else. Well, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, from the from the opening chapters of Genesis, sounds like uh, sex is a good thing and very important part of life. And why wouldn't it be celebrated? I did want to add just because. Um, so you brought up the uh, ESV study Bible. And uh, it has a long introduction here. I read part of it where they said, uh, you know, from the 19th century on, um, the majority of people have read it as uh, love poetry. Uh, but they, they have an entire section here on the allegorical interpretation. It says, the sensuous descriptions in this book have provided motivation to read the Song of Solomon as an allegory, namely as an extended picture of the love between Israel's God and his people, and then between Christ and his bride, either uh, the church or the individual soul. This approach, in fact, dominated exposition of the book until the 19th century. The limitation of such an approach, however, is that it runs the risk of diminishing the wisdom character of the Song of Solomon and its endorsement of God's good work of creation as evidenced in marital love. But even though, and this is the part I wanted to get to, but even though virtually all scholarly interpreters today see the book primarily as a celebration of love and the gift of sexual intimacy, some would add that the Song of Solomon by showing the pure and passionate love of the man and the woman in the story can also enable believers to appreciate more deeply the intensity of the spiritual love relationship between God and his people. So the modern the modern allegorical interpretation will be, yes, it's primarily about uh, marital, uh, marital love and physical intimacy, uh, but you can get an idea. It, it helps you understand the love between um, God and the church. But notice they said virtually all interpreters from the 19th century yeah. onward interpret this at least primarily about uh, yeah. sexual intimacy between a man and a woman. But just again, just to recap, which I will do over and over again, because this guy's in most almost his entire video seems to be refuting the idea that uh, that this is just, you know, physical, you know, love poetry about physical relationship between a, a husband and wife. Um we can grant, we can grant all of that. If it's allegorical, <laughs> guess, if it's allegorical, great. Then it's about God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church. That's not, not helping Islam either way. Yeah, we'll just agree with Ellen Davis, who's not a Muslim. I mean, or, you know, we'll bring up John Bergsman later, who's a Catholic. Like, th again, you keep citing people who take it as allegorical, who disagree with your allegorical interpretation, which proves our point that if you take it as allegorical, you become basically the arbiter of truth and can read whatever you want and into it to make it say what you want. And therefore, this is just not evidence of anything if people are coming with wildly, vastly different interpretations. Like, it's just, why are you citing Christians and Jews saying this is allegorical if they read this and didn't come out of the, come out reading it and become Muslim? You're basically proving that so many people have read this, didn't find Muhammad in it, and then came away and were still Christians and Jews. Like, shooting yourself in the foot much? And especially if you're talking about scholars, the scholars are studying this and they're studying it in Hebrew and they're, they're reading Mahmadim and they're not going, oh my goodness, that's Muhammad's name there. That's that's Muhammad's name. We all need to convert because that's Muhammad's name there. Why? Because they would know what that word means. And they would say it makes no sense to it. Would, it makes no sense for that word to be Muhammad there. Uh, so in other words. Jewish Jewish allegorical interpretation, God loves Israel. And that's what this is actually about. Uh, Christian allegorical interpretation. 
Christ loves the church. And so there, there's, there's that loving relationship there. If this is Muhammad, what is this about? <laughs> it's, it's about how sweet he is and how sweet his mouth is because who's the woman, think it's, who's it's, the woman in the story. <laughs> it's, it's clearly, um, his nine-year-old child, right? Obviously. It's gotta be right. <laughs> so this, is, this is a little girl. <laughs> it's kind of ruins everything. <laughs> Ugh, gross. All right. So we're we going back to this. Yeah, let's play it out. All right. So uh, it looks like he's going to be arguing a lot that this is allegorical and we don't actually, I mean, we don't agree with that, but we don't agree that this helps your case at all. It does. So let's go. And traditionally, the Jews and Christians both have understood this text allegorically. As Bruce Metzger says, its inclusion in the Jewish and Christian canon is due to its acceptance as an allegory of God's love for Israel or of Christ's love for the church. The Orthodox Study Bible, a book which I have seen I beholding in his own videos, remarks that the Song of Songs is written in the language of human love and courtship, but also speaks prophetically of God's love for his beloved bride, his church. This is confirmed by multiple other sources, such as the Catholic Study Bible, which says the same thing, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, which says the same thing, Sepharia, which says the same thing, and many more. Furthermore, Dr. John Bergsma, a scholar who IP himself will be interviewing in defense of Mosaic authorship, pokes fun at the idea that the Song of Solomon is simply a book of pickup lines and agrees with the interpretation that it is the holy oh cool you're gonna be interviewing this guy i just did i interviewed him on my channel yesterday and we, he was arguing that the pentateuch uh is extremely early dates back to 1200 bc so it's extremely early he's got a lot of, a lot of good evidence we went over that the pentateuch is actually very very old going back to moses wait so you didn't ask this guy if song of solomon is about muhammad uh, no, because that wasn't the focus of the interview. You need to get to that guy back on and say, wait a minute, you said you don't think it's allegorical. I mean, you, you, know, you said you think it's allegorical. So do you agree that this is about Muhammad? <laughs> I mean, obviously he, he had to, if it's obviously an allegorical book, he had to come away with it's Muhammad because as this guy says, it's so clearly mentioning Muhammad. Everyone should just obviously see that except all the Jewish and Christian scholars who interpret it allegorically and come away with like, not converting to Islam, but just to, for, besides them, everyone who's read it knows it's an allegory and comes away believing it's about Muhammad, except all the people who haven't. Yeah. So in other words, this guy could name, if he wanted to, name a hundred Jewish and Christian scholars over the centuries who all have an allegorical interpretation of this, and not mm -hmm. one of them would say, oh yeah, it's about Muhammad. So not one of them is actually helping his case. Right. Uh, quick comment here from uh, Benjamin in the Super Chat. Hey, David, how would you respond to a Muslim who claims that the Gospels is not what the Quran is talking about, but it's talking about an original Gospel that the New Testament Gospels are based on? God bless you. Uh, yeah, and Benjamin, that's one of the first things that's going to come up. So if you, uh, if you, so basically you say, look, it says right here in the Gospel of John that, you know, Jesus said this or something like that. And if it disagrees with Islam, they have to say, well, the Gospel has been corrupted. And then you point out that according to the Quran, the Gospel is given by Allah. And you can point out passages like Surah 18, verse 27, Surah 6, 115, which say no one can change Allah's words. And of course, they're going to have to say, well, that only refers to his words in the Quran, even though that's not what Allah says. Allah doesn't say no one can change his words in the Quran. He just says no one can change his words, period, which contradicts what almost every Muslim in the world will tell you. They say his words have been corrupted over and over and over again. Um, but notice this is actually this response is actually not open to them. Why? Surah 7, verse 157 of the Quran says that Jews and Christians were still reading the Torah and the gospel during the time of Muhammad. Doesn't say you're, you're, they're reading some later corrupted work. It says they're reading the Torah and the gospel, which means that whatever the Quran is referring to, it wasn't something that we had for five years and then we later lost or was corrupted. They still had it. Uh, also, going with this interpretation that what we have in the gospels is a later corruption and the Quran's only affirming the original, Surah 5, verse 47, Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel, not by the Quran tells them to judge by the gospel. That makes no sense if the gospel has been corrupted or changed. Mm -hmm. um, Surah 5, verse 66 and Surah 5, verse 68, both affirm that Christians are commanded to judge by and obey and stand upon the gospel. And so these passages just make absolutely no sense. Like, uh, just to give you an example, the way I view the Quran 
is the way lots of Muslims view the gospel. In other words, the Quran, is act it actually stole some stuff that's true and combined it with a bunch of corrupt nonsense, right? So that's how your average Muslim thinks, it, that's what your average Muslim thinks happened with the gospel. Would I, as a Christian, tell Muslims, guys, you have to obey the Quran. That's what you need to do in life. If you want to be right with God, you just, you have to live by the Quran. No, I wouldn't say that. Why? Because it contains a bunch of falsehood. So if Allah is constantly telling the Christians of the time of Muhammad, so 7th century Christians, he's telling them they have to judge by the gospel and they have no ground to stand upon unless they stand upon the gospel. If that's a corrupt book, then he's saying you 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 have to live by a corrupt book. Don't go to the Quran, go by your corrupt book. And uh, I would just say that's that's going to lead to uh, all kinds of problems. But notice it's uh, notice Benjamin, what they're actually stuck with is their book affirming our book and their book affirming our book as the evidence for our book, but our <laughs> book not lining up with their book. And so them being forced to say that our book has been corrupted. And yet our corrupt book is supposedly the evidence for their true book. And this is the situation we're in now, arguing that uh, ah, Song of Solomon is our allegorical. And e even though it makes no sense, this is somehow proof of Muhammad. Yeah. <laughs> Good summary, IP. Yeah, that's perfect. All right. So that brings us right back to Muhammad and our corrupt book. <laughs> <laughs> and they are really, really, really devoted to finding Muhammad in our corrupt book. <laughs> ridiculous guys i mean we we're sitting here laughing this is insane <laughs> hey guys don't believe in your book your book's been corrupted don't believe in that book <laughs> that book will just lead you astray oh okay well should we believe in your guy instead yeah yeah you should believe in our guy don't believe in that book okay why why should we believe in your guy because he's in that book he's in that <laughs> book believe in him because he's in that it's like how do you not how do you not instantly spot how insane this is but welcome to dawa ladies and gentlemen welcome to dawa <laughs> this is amazing you ready for some Always more dawa oh go yes this is amazing <laughs> here we go and you're interviewing the guy he says it's allegorical how do you respond to that ip boom here's some more to the holy books not only that but he mentions how this book was read by the jews as a messianic book in anticipation of the coming messiah and argues in detail how the apostle john having walked with jesus christ wrote his gospel highlighting the ways in which jesus fulfills aspects of the song of solomon the art scroll tanakh series points out that solomon foresaw through the holy spirit that israel is destined to suffer a series of exiles meaning things that will happen in the future on top of that, numerous Christian commentaries interpret the songs as pointing towards Christ. Examples include the Kaufman Commentary, the Smith's Bible Commentary, Gill's Exposition on the Whole Bible, Henry's Complete Commentary, the Enduring Word Commentary, Benson's Commentary, as well as church fathers like Gregory of Nyssa, Ambrose of Milan, Origen of Alexandria, St. Bernard, and many more. The Gospel of This is, uh, I mentioned that this is the approach that, uh, that I saw. For some reason, I was able to instantly see what was going on. But uh, so the, the first argument I was ever given for Islam was Song of Solomon 516 track. Mm -hmm. The first full fledge actually sitting down going through an argument was the scientific miracles argument. I watched, I think it was an hour, hour and 15 minute documentary on the scientific miracles. And I noticed something over and over again. They would quote a Quran verse and then there would be seven or eight minutes of awesome graphics and all these sources and stuff up on the screen. Boom, 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 boom. They're firing it, firing it, firing it. And I'm sitting there looking, I'm sitting there looking, I'm sitting there looking going, what did any of this have to do with that verse? What did any of this have? There's nothing that you're saying right now, which has anything to do with your argument. Who is this meant for? Who is, this is meant for some, some person who's just sitting there going, oh, wow, they, they put a bunch of sources up on the screen and put a bunch of stuff up on the screen. So it must, they must really know what they're talking about. In other words, it's, it's trying to establish credibility so that you don't question what the person says. And you just say, okay, this person must know what he's talking about. And so this guy put a bunch of stuff up on the screen. What did any of this have to do with Muhammad in Song of Solomon? I would say absolutely nothing. Nothing he ever presented would help his case even slightly. And if I didn't, so notice, if I didn't know that this is the same guy who said, oh, it says dark like the tents of Qadar. That has to be Muhammad. It's like, wait a minute, that's the woman talking. If I didn't know already that this guy 
is just a guy who's searching, searching, searching. Oh, this could sound like this. Oh, oh, this could help. Oh, this could help. Not someone who's actually trying to understand things and then concluding whether it supports Muhammad. He's like already decided ahead of time that this supports Muhammad and he looks for confirmation. If I didn't know that and he starts putting a bunch of stuff up on the screen, you think, oh, wow, this guy's sharp. This guy really does his research. No, this guy, he noted it. This is, this is exactly what you see from Daniel Hakikachu, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He like, he will, he will, Hakikachu will cite a bunch of studies, completely misrepresents all of them. Nothing actually supports what he's saying. And yet his fans go, wow, he's so reliable. Look at all this de dedicated research he did. Well, I mean, some of the commentaries he mentioned, okay, so he's mentioned the enduring word commentary, which comes from David Guzik. I don't think that guy's even a scholar. I can't find any credentials for him. Uh, but he mentioned like Benson's commentary. That's from like 200 years ago. Matthew Henry's to like 200 years ago. Like these, like what is this again? This is not the scholarly consensus. He's just citing whatever he can possibly find from throughout the century to support his position. And again, even if he's right, all of these commentators say this is, don't say this is about Muhammad. So even if they're right, None of this points to Muhammad. They all have read this as an allegory and did not come away from the conclusion this mentions Muhammad. This just supports my point. When you make this an allegory, you can read it as whatever you want. So again, there's no reason for Christians or Jews to see Muhammad in this because A, our theologians haven't, and we can just read it in a different way. And so come away with a different conclusion. So this doesn't support Islam whatsoever. And they've wasted so much time basically trying desperately to find him in this passage. And now they can't even admit that, that Mahmadim is a proper name. So it's like they're retreating on that. And like, where are they going with it at this point? Yeah. So uh, again, ju just to recap everyone, um, I, I do not interpret this. I do not interpret Song of Solomon as an allegory. I interpret it just as what it, what it looks like. I grant that you can, I mean, it's indisputable that you can read it as an allegory. I would say it's even it's even plausible to read it as an allegory. It's not I don't think it means that, but I can see why some people do. It has nothing to do with whether Muhammad is mentioned. <laughs> like like <laughs> yeah. allegory, if it's allegorical, nothing to do with Muhammad. If it's not allegorical, nothing to do with Muhammad. Either way, nothing to do with Muhammad. What's it got to do with Muhammad? Well, we'll get to that. He's going to try to show us Muhammad's right in that chapter later. All right. Well, everyone be ready to have your mind blown. <laughs> Look at this. We're helping them do Dawah. We're, we're sitting here get, letting him give his entire presentation for Muhammad in Song of Solomon to, to bring, everyone up to, uh, bring everyone up to date and, uh, and come up with his new 2.0 version of the argument of Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik, which it seems it seems like he would acknowledge is a completely bogus argument, and therefore yeah, he needs thank, to thank, be upgraded. Thankfully, one. yeah, I appreciate him doing that. That's so helpful because now we can, in the future, if any Muslims say that it mentions his name, I'm going to just show them this video. No, nope, look, Muslims say that it's not his name. So who's right? Which Muslim should can believe? Because yeah, I, I guarantee I, Muslims will come to me saying, yes, it mentions his name. It's a proper noun right there. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it, it, I do have to say I am loving this young generation of Muslims who are like throwing, <laughs> throwing the, throwing Zakir Naik and Ahmed Dina and all these guys that came before them under the bus. Ah, they're all wrong. I'm 12 years old. I know better. John is not the only book in the New Testament that allegorically interprets a song of songs and interprets it to Christ, as Dr. John Bergsma points out, but there are others as well. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul speaks about the church and makes reference to an allegorical interpretation of chapter 4 of Song of Solomon. Many commentaries confirm this, such as the Bengals Noman commentary, Matthew Poole's commentary, Meyer's New Testament commentary, and the Cambridge Bible commentary. Revelations chapter 3 verse 20 again makes reference to Song of Solomon chapter 5 and it applies it to Christ and this is confirmed by commentaries like Cambridge Bible Commentary and the Expositor's Greek New Testament. So if you want to insist that the Song of Solomon is not an allegorical text and it's simply erotic poetry with no deeper meaning, you have to throw all Jewish tradition under the bus, all Christian tradition under the bus, multiple early church fathers all under the bus, it. numerous Christians. All, all of it. it. Even though... Everyone. <laughs> even though most since the 19th century would agree with us, but uh, he says and no. And again, in the New Testament, they're doing typology. I, I fully acknowledge most, most of the New Testament authors do typology. But again, that's starting with your theology and then just finding passages from the Old Testament to fit the theology, which is fine. I, again, I didn't say that's wrong, but you can't use your typology as evidence for your religion. So, but he wants to use this as evidence for his Islam, so it doesn't work. Mm-hmm.
commentaries under the bus, your own scholar, Dr. John Bergsma, under the bus, as well as ultimate. <laughs> Quit throwing them and under the bus. Up. Yeah, and I mean, notice. Dr. Dot. Yeah, no, it, yeah. It's he's actually throwing them under the bus. We're not throwing guys under the bus. We're saying we disagree. We're saying we're inter we're interpreting things differently. Um, yeah, and again, I'm fine with Bergma doing an allegorical interpretation. I'm, fi I don't I'm, think I'm fine. I'm that. fine with anyone. I just don't. I don't think that's what it means. I fully grant you can interpret it that way, but I would agree with you. You can't. You can't then build an an argument based on yeah, that. Berg Bergsma doesn't use this as evidence for Christianity. I've never seen anyone who does. It's like, oh look. Yeah. <laughs> so notice if if it, if it was this guy, it, it, here's here's. Here would be a parallel from a Christian. Guys, This, if we were doing what this guy's doing, so we'd have to say, oh, you've got this uh, love love poetry in Song of Solomon. Uh, it would be kind of naughty to just have this, uh, you know, sexual content <laughs> right in the middle of the Bible. Therefore, it must be an allegory. I'm a Christian, so what would this be an allegory of? This would be about Christ's love for the church. Oh my goodness, everyone, everyone needs to convert to Christianity because of this book about Christ's love for the church. Convinced? Yeah, no, if you're if you're <laughs> if you're not a if you're not already a Christian, you wouldn't you would look at that and go, I mean, you could read it that way, but that's <laughs> not that, that's not evidence. That's not evidence. You're 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 acknowledging it. You're I mean, you're you're just interpreting that way. There's nothing in the text that says, "Oh yeah, this is obviously about Jesus." And so, yeah, and so no one would use this as evidence, but that's how they're using it. So, and exactly. and I still have no idea. <laughs> like, okay, we'll if, it, if, it, if it's allegory, if it's allegory, and you're using that as evidence, putting your interpretation in there, which we would never do, which Christians would wouldn't do, uh, you need to do that. And so, you're going to have to put a pretty powerful case up here about how uh, this is actually about how? Muhammad Muhammad boning his child bride, and this proves that Islam is true. Yeah. The New Testament. And in doing so, as Ellen Davis notes, you simply turn it into the biggest religious mockery of all time. Now we get into the chapter, Song of Solomon, mm. chapter 5. In verse 2, we see that it says, Did I his background change? Is he recording this over multiple days? I guess so. Yeah. Or just, uh, his hair changes, un so I'd say, just yeah. unclicked his background. To simply right. turn it into the biggest religious mockery of all time. Now we get into the chapter, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. In verse 2, we see that it says, I sleep, but my heart is awake, indicating that this is a dream. Now, what are dreams in the Bible? In Numbers chapter 12, we see that God points out that Moses is unique among the prophets because God spoke to him directly, whereas with other prophets, he speaks to them in dreams or visions. And scholars have understood this to mean that dreams are not direct speech, but rather they consist of symbolisms which need to be interpreted. And this is confirmed by commentaries like the Matthew Poole's commentary, the Benson's commentary, the Smith's Bible commentary, and Clark's commentary. And quite often through the Bible, we see that this is the case. Unless the dream is a command to do something, the dreams are symbolic and often prophetic, such as when Joseph can he just cite some commentaries from today's day and age why is it always like what can he just find on bible hub from like 200 years ago like this is insanely idiotic so you've got the you've got the uh the, the claim about dreaming there and therefore what's he saying that the entire thing is a dream and therefore prophetic i'm yes, trying to figure out what he's even making, saying well he's noting that it, it mentions in song of solomon 5 that she's having a dream of her lover okay uh -huh. fine but yeah. here's the problem he compares it to other dreams, like Joseph interpreting dreams. When that happens in the Bible, the prophet interprets the dream, like in Daniel 2, or like with Joseph. Uh -huh. He interprets the dream. There is no interpreter, as Tremper Longman notes, in Song of Solomon. So if this is this dream is an allegory of something else, where is the prophetic interpretation? Are modern Muslims really the final prophets? They can interpret Song of Solomon better than anyone else because they have this prophetic power. If they're telling us they know how to properly interpret this dream. They're claiming to be basically prophets, that they have some sort of divine insight into this. And yeah, I mean, you've got the con. Someone <laughs> saying, I have a dream, therefore this entire book is a, prof a prophetic dream without explanation. Um, notice this is still Solomon's wife saying she had a dream, and she says who she's having a dream about her beloved. And so if this guy's saying she's having a dream and this is actually about Muhammad, then this is Solomon's bride having a prophetic dream lusting after Muhammad's body. <laughs> it's like yeah. just, 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 just saying, Hey, if you're right, then this is what this means is usually enough 
to show how insane this is. Well, again, there's no interpreter. So mu Muslims have to be the interpreter. They have to be the prophetic interpreters, proving they, they are the new final messengers. And therefore, they know how to properly interpret it. Again, when Daniel's got dreams, there's an interpreter. When Joseph has dreams, he interprets them. Okay, if dreams are allegorical or symbolic, there is someone there to interpret it. If not, you don't get to play the role of prophet and interpret for us, okay? Because everyone will interpret it differently. Yeah, and imagine, I mean, imagine what this guy's doing here. So imagine you have a, let's suppose you had Joseph. So Joseph had dreams. Suppose Joseph had a dream and he said, yes, I had a dream about my wife. And you're going to say, oh, when it means wife, it, 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 it means Aisha. Be like, what? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. He said he said he had a dream about his wife, not some other person. If 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 Solomon's bride says she had a dream about her beloved and you say, oh, that's Muhammad. That's that's a pretty massive stretch there. It I, is. Yeah. It, and, but again, they somehow have some super insight. It's and notice, this. notice this would, uh, this would make her, her a prophet. So she's the one having this dream. So she'd be the prophet here. She would and be, so, yes. And so you have a prophetess committing adultery in her mind by lusting after Muhammad, <laughs> even though, even though she's Solomon's bride, right? So now, oh now God. she's a prophet having prophetic visions of Muhammad and lusting after his hot bod. And modern Muslims are now the final messengers of Allah because they can now properly interpret this with their prophetic abilities. Powerful stuff. Awesome, awesome stuff. All right. Of the stars bowing down to him, which signified that his family members would bow down to him. When... No, notice he's actually going through the dreams and saying, see, and here's what the dream means. Yes. Why? Because the text explains what the dreams mean. <laughs> I mean, anytime someone says, I had a dream, you go, oh, let me tell you, it's actually about Muhammad. I had a dream today. Oh, Martin Luther King, he had a dream. This must be about Muhammad. It's got to be about Muhammad. See, supporting Islam is the truth. Gosh. Pharaoh had the dream of the cows, which signified famine, or when the man in Judges had a dream and it signified Gideon's victory. <laughs> he keeps saying, look, here's all these dreams that completely explain what they're about. Or when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream in Daniel 2 where the statue... And then it was fully explained. Well, wow. <laughs> no, no, I'm noticing a pattern with the dreams that are meant to be prophecies. They explain the prophecies. Oh, wow. The kingdoms. Or in Daniel 4 or in Daniel 7 where the beasts signified the kingdoms. And this is the case with the dream in the Song of Solomon. The bride represents something. The beloved represents something. This is how dreams and visions work. Wait, the bride... Look, look, look at what he just said. Because this... Dude, this is slimy. This is slimy. So you had Joseph, he had dreams. You had Daniel having dreams. The bride has dreams, and he says, therefore, the bride represents something. Wait a minute. That, that means like Joseph represents, if Joseph had the dream, then Joseph represents something, right? He's mm -hmm. not an actual person. He's he he represents something. Look who this dude just did. That was massively. How do his followers take him seriously after that, right? He said, look, mm. Joseph had dreams. And those dream and those things represent those things in the dream represented something. Uh, uh, Daniel had dreams. Those things in the dream represented something. He goes, ah, the bride has a dream here. So the bride must represent, wait, what? The bride is the one having the dream. Is an actual person having the dream? She's a prophetess. She says she's dreaming about her beloved. We know who the, who her beloved was. If you're saying that she's actually dreaming about Muhammad, then she's lusting after some other dude. She's an adulterous prophetess. Yes. And, but, but she represents something. So maybe it's Mecca dreaming about Muhammad. Who knows? I mean, he doesn't ever explain it. Yeah, this is just, my goodness. This is pretty much exactly <laughs> what I would expect from the brilliant mind of, oh, it said, it said, uh, it said, it said she's dark. Therefore, be, it's about Muhammad, even though that's the girl. To be fair, on TikTok, after he did admit he was wrong about that, that, that thing in Song of Solomon 1, I do remember him mentioning that several months ago, that, yeah, okay, that was wrong, but I'm still right. This is about Muhammad yeah. somehow. Like, yeah, and, and yeah, the, the point, of course, is that you kind of expose your method. If you are that sloppy, then you're a guy who simply scrolls stuff looking for some sort of confirmation. Exactly. And uh, unless you have a massive change of methodology, this is not the sort of thing we would we should be taking seriously. But let's see where he's going. Maybe he's got some great thing. But guys, don't miss what he just did. He says, oh, the woman says she had a dream and... People in the Old Testament have dreams, and those dreams mean something. They, they, they can be prophetic. IP pointed out that, yeah, those prophetic dreams, they explain them. They explain what they mean. 
Here, you don't have that. She just said, I had a dream. Um, and he's saying, therefore, the woman represents something. She represents something. It's not an oopsie. Not not at all what we've uh, what you were just saying. All right. And as Alan F. Davis points out, which I already quoted, the Song of Solomon is a mosaic of quotations and passages of different books throughout the Old Testament. And as we will see, nearly every verse of this song alludes to a different biblical prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even foreshadows. Uh, <laughs> that's kind of a big yeah, step right there. Wait, that was a he big sure step is. right there. He said, did he say practically every verse of this alludes to another prophecy about Muhammad? Yes. Did he just yes, say he that? He, hang on, hang on. He hang on. Act <laughs> Oh boy! Did you catch that? It's everyone? amazing! It's so, amazing! So now, so the the Song of Solomon is all, allegorical, and practically every verse. Let me. I, I don't. I do not want to misquote this guy. Uh, so let me go and see what he said. It's. I. I thought he said practically every verse of Song of Solomon alludes to some other Old Testament uh, verse that is a prophecy about Muhammad. So hang on work. And as Alan F. Davis points out, which I already quoted, the Song of Solomon is a mosaic of quotations and passages of different books throughout the Old Testament. And as we will see, nearly every verse of this song alludes to a different biblical prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And nearly every verse of this love song <laughs> alludes Wait. to a prophecy about Muhammad. Wait Overstatement much? Hyper Wait until you see the verses he tries. Hyperbolic. So now, he says nearly everyone, so you could kind of go to almost any one. Can we assume, IP, can we assume that he's going to give us the best? Of course. I okay. would assume, he's saying he could go to pretty much any of them. We're going to assume that the, the examples he gives are the best of the best. Right? That makes sense? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, frankly, Garcia here says, uh, Muslims latch on to the most irrelevant part of the arguments you present them. Yeah, that is a that is a common uh, common issue, uh, and and we see this over and over. yeah, Farid is like the champion of this. He'll like cling to you'll be you'll be giving ninety seven different points, and he'll latch on to one. Yeah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> very very strange. Uh, good clan here says, hey, uh, Doctor IP, Doctor David Wood, you guys are debunking Islam every day. Keep up uh, the good seed. Islam believes in. Uh, Islam believes is all about brainwashing, ain't it? You see, love the phrases. <laughs> it's funny when I start going, you see, and then everyone else starts going, you see, it cracks me up. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right, ready? Yep. And foreshadows his name, showing how he fulfills his name in Hebrew in that context, right, let me, meaning let me, holy Let desirable. me back this up because I mean, he's given us a lot. Out, which I already quoted, the Song of Solomon is a mosaic of quotations and passages of different books throughout the Old Testament. And as we will see, nearly every verse of this song alludes to a different biblical prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even foreshadows his name, showing how he fulfills his name in Hebrew in that context, meaning holy desirable. Verse 10 describes a beloved as a standard bearer of an army of 10,000. Whoa! <laughs> Did he say verse 10? <laughs> yes. He just said verse 10 presents him as a standard bearer of an army of 10,000. He just said that, right? It actually doesn't. The word for he's translating as chief in the King James uh, is translated as distinguished in the ESV. And that makes more sense. This word does not mean chief. It refers to, it's only used four times in the Bible. And outside of Song of Solomon, it's only used for raising a banner up. So you can like see it over like the crowd of soldiers. It's not referring to someone being a chief leading armies. It's referring to a banner standing out. This is why in the ESV, you'll see distinguish among 10,000. That yeah. they stand out among 10,000. Yeah, I've always, I've always interpreted that every time I've ever read it as, hey, if you lined up 10,000 people, this guy's the hottest one. <laughs> That's yes. all. I've always interpreted that. Uh, let me go ahead and pull this up here. Uh, so this is her. She says, my beloved is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. Radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. So notice what he said. This is referring to Muhammad. Uh, this is a, a prophecy about a man who would be the standard bearer of an, in front of an army of 10,000. And that can only be Muhammad. That's oh, what he just who did. Who else could ever, ever lead armies? Yeah. Who else could it possibly be? You see, this is the proof. <laughs> All right, let's go back.
Looking back to Deuteronomy 33, which describes the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Oh my goodness! Kidding that this is a dream. I accidentally threw myself off there in, in a fit of rage. Let's go find that. Where where was that? You're, you went a little too far ahead. You I went back. too far? Okay. Where is it? Yeah, you went. Let me see what Deuteronomy. he's saying. Yeah, it, nearly every verse of this song alludes to a different biblical okay, prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and even foreshadows his name, showing how he fulfills his name in Hebrew in that context, meaning wholly desirable. Verse 10 describes a beloved as a standard bearer of an army of 10,000, alluding back to Deuteronomy 33, which just Except it doesn't say standard banner bearer or army, but I'll just say that because my fans are too dumb to actually look up anything. Yeah. The prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as an agent of Yahweh who comes forth from Paran, the place where the Ishmaelites dwelt with an army. Did he just say an agent of Yahweh? <laughs> Yes. Oh dude, this is terrible. This is like, <laughs> at first, at first, I'm really thinking maybe this dude is really just clueless and he doesn't know how to use sources and stuff. Now it's like, how do you, how do you say these things and take yourself seriously? Like you start to think. You start to think, does this guy know he's being deceptive? Standard bearer of an army of 10,000, alluding back to Deuteronomy 33, which describes the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as an agent of Yahweh who comes forth from Paran, the place where the Ishmaelites dwelt with an army of 10,000. Did you catch what he just said, everyone? An agent of Yahweh <laughs> came from Paran, the area of the Ishmaelites. I got, I got to watch it again, man. 33, it's, which it's describes... Crazy. Guys, uh, it's important to get this down. This is a common thing. There are actually three places they go to that I can think of off the top of my head where it's talking about Yahweh and they say it's actually, it's actually referring to Muhammad as if Muhammad is Yahweh. So let's go ahead and look at this one more time so we understand what he's saying here about this passage. And this guy just committed shirk. Unforgiveness. Verse 10 describes a beloved as a standard bearer of an army of 10,000, alluding back to Deuteronomy 33, which describes the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as an agent of Yahweh who comes... Describes Muhammad as an agent of Yahweh. Should we take a peek at this? I mean, we could read it on the screen yeah, right here. But because let me... Deuteronomy 33 is not about... It's not a prophecy. It's describing Israel coming out of the desert from Sinai Wrong. Uh, to take over Canaan. It says it right here. It says it right here, IP. It says, this is the prophecy about Muhammad that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites. Right? So notice what you have here, ladies and gentlemen. Moses, uh, the time of Moses is coming to an end, and he gives them this blessing. He gives this blessing to the Israelites. This is the blessing that Moses the man of God pronounced on the Israelites before his death. He said, the Lord, see the all caps right there? The Lord, Yahweh, when you see Lord in all caps, that's Yahweh. The Lord, Yahweh, came from Sinai and dawned over them from Seir. He, who, Muhammad, he shone forth from Mount Paran, he came with myriads of holy ones from the south, from his mountain slopes. This Muslim apologist just said this is Muhammad. It's Yahweh. Yeah. It specifically says Yahweh came and from Sinai, dawned over them from Seir, and sh he shone forth from Mount Paran. This guy just said this is Muhammad. And then if you read past that verse four says when moses commanded us Allah as a possession for the assembly of jacob so it's clearly talking about when israel came out of the desert from sinai paran to invade canaan and also there is no tense in hebrew there's completed and uncompleted actions and the verbs in this are very much completed so it's talking about something that has already happened now what this guy will do in tiktok as i've seen him do it before is he'll go no this is a prophecy because habakkuk 3 3 is in the future tense and it's talking about something that's going to come which is demonstrably false uh he used like a very outdated translation i saw in the past to try to make that habakkuk is either in either translated in present or past tense and most likely past tense given the overall structure of the whole passage again just referring to what happened in deuteronomy 33. none of neither habakkuk 3 or deuteronomy 33 is a prophecy about something that come it's talking about Israel coming out of the desert. And unless you cherry pick the passage, like you can't make this be about Muhammad. You've got to cherry pick and lie about it. Like you just can't even cherry pick. You got to cherry pick and lie about it. Um, and I mean, my goodness, man, this is, and that makes perfect. 
that passage makes perfect sense, right? I've heard people describe it as, you know, watching the sunrise and this representing God or something like this. But I mean, they're going, when they're going through the desert and eventually uh, ar arriving at the border of, of the Holy Land, they've got this pillar of, this pillar of cloud by day and this pillar of fire by night. And that pillar of cloud is going all these places. And they say, and so Moses in giving this up, the Lord did this, the Lord did that, the Lord this, and you got Muslim. Yep, that's Muhammad. Muhammad is the pillar of cloud that went in front of them. Muhammad's the pillar of cloud. Muhammad's the pillar of fire. No, we don't commit shirk. We're the religion that doesn't deify men. But that when it says Yahweh, that means Muhammad. That's Muhammad right there. Yeah, it, in the past, we don't commit shirk. I, I don't even know. I don't even know what they see in this passage. It's it's like. Are we even reading the same thing? Like, I, like they just they read Islam into the text constantly, and then therefore just mm -hmm. say they're right. Yeah, the see what this guy does, but he does it with a bunch of sources. So he'll just you know search through the commentaries that are available online and say, "You see, look, this lines up." That's exactly what guys did. What uh, the Muslim Dawa guys like D dot and so on did back in the day. They got a concordance. They looked up everything that could have anything to do with Arabs, with Paran, with Ishmael, anything. They searched for it. They did a search. They, they looked up, okay, here's every reference to Paran. Let me go through. Up, oh, that one won't work. Up, oh, that one won't work. Up, oh, that one won't work. Oh, this one I can I can use. And I can say this is about this is about Islam. And they're so sloppy. They were so sloppy with this. That it would say Yahweh did something and say, oh, but I mean, it does. Yahweh came from Paran. Mm, maybe it's an agent of Yahweh coming from Paran. So an agent and that agent would be up. Oh, that would be Muhammad. And that's like the 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 level of stupidity and deception that we're dealing with. And here we are mm -hmm. decades later. And this guy's just just taking it for granted that when this says Yahweh, it's actually talking about and Muslims. If you don't know how insane this sounds. Uh, so there are. There are hadiths which say that Allah descends to the lowest heaven in the, you know, the third part of the night. Allah descends to the lowest heaven. Muslims have problems with that when they say that Allah doesn't enter his creation. He's clearly moving around in creation. So, But ignore all of that. If I, suppose, suppose I come to you and I say, this is actually about me. I went downstairs. You know, I'm upstairs right now. Earlier, I went downstairs. The third part of the night, I went downstairs. That actually happened. That actually happened. I stay awake at night. And in the third part of the night, I went downstairs. So that's actually about me. You would say, no, it says Allah right there. No, 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 it's about me. I'm an agent of Allah. I'm an agent of Allah. I went downstairs. The prophecy about me. This is, saying I, this is saying I represent God. You would look at that and you would say, David, I can't tell if you are absolutely insane or the biggest liar who's ever walked the planet. But there's no way for you to read Allah descended to the lowest heaven as you walking downstairs. And this is somehow <laughs> proof of you. You would say, David, that is insane. Muslims, that's what you sound like to us when you say, oh, it says, oh, we just we just finished the whole Exodus. And it says Yahweh came from here. And oh, when it says Yahweh, it's actually Muhammad talking about Muhammad coming here. You sound insane when you say that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's. The, the way they just, again, is, as I said on TikTok recently, you're just going, if you just read Islam into the text, you're going to find Islam on the text. So again, they're just arguing in a circle. None of this is actually proof of their religion if they just read it into the text and lie about what it says. These are the people who are against shirk and yet commit shirk more than uh, anyone I am ever familiar with. The chief export of Saudi Arabia is idolatry. Cedric says, shouldn't we be concerned that Muhammad actually had a dream about Aisha and proceeded to tell her? Was that allegorical too? <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Be, let's say it was. It'd be interesting to uh, inter <laughs> interpret. <laughs> yeah, so notice, I mean, he interpreted it as just, hey, I need to go, uh, I need to go have sex with this girl. God's giving her to me. Um, yeah, I wish, I wish Muhammad had interpreted that as allegorical and not uh, taking that girl's He should have. He should have. Yeah. You should have taken the advice of modern Muslim apologists and known his dream was allegorical. It wasn't really allowing him to have a child bride. But yes, this isn't telling me to molest this little girl. It's telling me to molest the kufar. There you go. With <laughs> jihad. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to do. All right, let's go back to this.
forth from Paran, the place where the Ishmaelites dwelt with an army of 10,000. Verse 11 onwards not only accurately describes the physical characteristics of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, but also alludes back to Daniel 2 which prophesizes Islam as the kingdom of God. In verse 11, the beloved is described as having a head made of the finest gold and the rest of his appearance is described as being the most ideal. Wait, we said he was going to go with his best stuff and Muhammad's head being made of gold is the best example? <laughs> Why are... Here's what I don't understand about this. It's describing his physical appearance, but the woman in Song of Solomon is describing how sexy Solomon is. Are modern Muslims like, do they think Muhammad is just sexy? Like, do they, they need to like read him into the Song of Solomon because they just find him so sexual that, you know, oh, this is clearly, this woman cannot get enough of Muhammad. It's describing his you know, sexually attractive he is. Like, why would you want to say that, that this is what you prophesize, how sexually attractive he is? That makes no sense. He's sexy and he knows it. It's about Muhammad being super sexy. Which oh, is yes, in definitely. contrast to the statue in Daniel 2, whose head is made of gold, but the successive body parts deteriorate in quality. And this parallel has been noticed by scholars like Ellen F. Davis, who in her commentary on the Song of Songs talks about how the beloved is being contrasted with the statue in Daniel 2. Verse 6. Wait. Yeah, that's his stretch. First of all, David Carr says in the formation of the Hebrew Bible that Song of Solomon is probably quite old based on some of the metaphors it used. So it's probably long before Daniel was written. Yeah. And if this guy, I mean, if, the, if this guy's, if these guys are granting that it's inspired, then OK, so this is either this is either written by Solomon or it's written in his honor. But yes, this would be older, significantly older than Daniel. So now it's. Wait. Now it's, oh, this person is contrasting this with this prophecy in Daniel that comes centuries later. And so what you got, no matter what you have, you got time travel. No matter what you do, you got time travel involved here. So we're, well, we'll, Daniel we'll 2 is not about Islam. I mean, it, it's not. It's about someone establishing a kingdom in Israel. I mean, you're, if you, again, if you presuppose Islam is true, you can read that into the text, but then you can't use that as evidence for Islam because there is nothing in Daniel 2 which explicitly says there's going to be some kingdom coming out of Arabia. And that would also, and also, if that's the truth, the caliphate doesn't exist anymore. So could we say this is a failed prophecy? So I don't understand how, I don't know how he specifically interprets it because he just brushes over this really fast. But again, the only way you get Islam in Daniel 2 is if you read that into the text because the Israelite authors are not writing about some Arabian kingdom. That doesn't even make sense with the context. Yeah, and I mean, it's pretty clear what they are talking about, the empires, the, the succession of empires that you had uh, during that time and thereafter. Um, but yeah, notice, using this guy's method, you could prove anything using this guy's method. Exactly. You could say that, you could say, that. You could say that's Mormonism right there in, in Daniel 2. And you could oh, say yeah. you could say this is talking about Joseph Smith. This this whole passage is about Joseph Smith. It's about Solomon's wife, uh, you know, lusting after Joseph Smith. You could say anyone. I, you could say this is Elon like Musk. You could say anything. Shakespeare. Shakespeare had dark hair. So there. It's, yeah. it's Shakespeare. There, yeah, yeah, see, see, it's it's clear as day. It's clear as day. Oh boy. So, <laughs> a, a, as a general rule, if the methodology you're using could be used to prove absolutely anything probably need a new methodology because well, i can i can prove that to you that using this guy's methodology that muhammad is clearly talked about in numbers 22 oh we've got a minute and 26 do you want to cut to numbers 22 or you want to finish this up what do you want to do let's uh let's finish it up and then i'll, I'll do that yeah okay so he's given his most powerful stuff and he's got uh uh his head is gold and so yeah muhammad's head is was about, gold and th this is a clear this is a clear reference to all the gold that muhammad stole when he was out robbing caravans <laughs> He says his mouth is most sweet, referring to the revelation of the Quran, where even the greatest poet of that time considered that it could not be the word of man. In this, what did he just say? He basically proved my point. He's reading Islam into the text that 516, when it says his mouth is most sweet, refers to Muhammad delivering beautiful revelations. But you only think Muhammad delivered beautiful revelations if you already think Islam is true. So, so. It's arguing in a circle. You assume Islam is true. Therefore, Song of Solomon 516 is about Muhammad delivering revelations. And then therefore, this is about Muhammad. And then therefore, you use this as evidence of Islam. It's arguing in a circle. Like, that's literally what they're doing. He's proving my point. You have to read Islam into 516 when it says his mouth is most sweet. 
because that has to be about him delivering revelations. But how do you know it's about him delivering revelations? Well, because we know Islam is already true. Well, then, yeah, exactly. You're arguing in a circle. Um, my goodness, man, this is so dumb. Um, <laughs> let me see what he said. He, so his mouth, his mouth is sweet. His mouth is sweetness itself. This refers to the sweetness of Muhammad's revelations. And notice, he just said Muhammad's Muhammad's contemporaries acknowledged that this could only come from God. You don't even get that in the Quran. In the Quran, over and over again, they say, we've heard this before. These are nothing but tales of the ancients. We know that someone's just giving you this stuff. That's what you read in the Quran. Where are you getting this idea that they're all, oh my goodness, this is so good. It must only come from God. Where are you getting? That's false according to the Quran. According to the Quran itself, they kept saying, we've heard this before. These are tales of the ancients. It's just this other guy telling you stuff. You're getting mm -hmm. all this from other people. You liar, you deceiver. And the Quran condemns them for these accusations. That's what you actually read in the Quran. It's like multiple layers of deception. It's like, oh yes, when Muhammad said these things to the unbelievers, they said, oh my God, isn't so powerful. What can we do? Not, it's not even according to the Quran. They thought it was a joke. They thought his revelations were a, a pathetic joke. And besides, what? why would this even be the Quran? Why wouldn't this be the rest of the things Muhammad said? Hang on. In Daniel 2. Verse 16 says his mouth is most sweet, referring to the revelation of the Quran, where even the greatest poets of that time considered that it could not be the word when of did they concede that? This when did they concede when? that? Because they joke, because they made a mockery out of it, and they constantly made fun of him. But notice it says his mouth is sweetness. Really? Is is the... is was Muhammad the source of the Quran? I thought that's the speech of Allah. Muhammad is just the mailman. If you want the actual oh. words, uh, if you want, if you want the actual words of Muhammad, sweetness itself. Here you, here you go. Ready to have your mind blown, IP? Go here you it. go. The prophet is saying, Mu Muawiyah uh, reported the prophet is saying, the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. <laughs> and when the eye sleeps, the leather strap is loosened. This, his mouth is sweetness itself. He's so, is, everything he says is so beautiful. IP, are you ready to convert to Islam? Look, right there. <laughs> in Song of Solomon 5, in Song of Solomon 5, she's talking about, I mean, she's talking about kissing this dude all the time. She says his mouth is sweetness, but this refers to the words of his mouth. And so we're 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 using this we're using the Dawa method of interpretation. So we're looking for someone with sweet words. Is that Shakespeare? No. Is that Joseph Smith? No. It's got to be Muhammad because his words were so sweet. All right, let's look at the words of Muhammad. I I found some. The eyes are the leather strap of the anus. What are you laughing at? <laughs> I just gave you an airtight argument for Islam. She says his words are sweet, so you're looking for the sweet words. Muhammad gave the sweetest words ever. He broke it down. The eyes oh, are the leather goodness. strap of the anus, man. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I'm dead serious here. The eyes are the leather strap of the anus. Those words are sweet to really, really weird people, and those words are sweet. And she said his mouth is sweetness itself, and so this is the this is the proof. This is a proof, man. Uh, I... I'm tearing up. This is amazing. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I have, I, every day I deal with Muslim apologists, I am just, thank, thank, thank you, Lord. I can roll this religion out. It is clearly nonsense. <laughs> we got to put the, you no, know, not if you put this together. It says <laughs> his mouth is sweet. That's referring to his words. The eyes of the leather strap of the anus. That's the proof. If you don't, if you it's reject proof. it, okay, we good? Oh, hang on, we got like I'll, a minute. I'll be right. <laughs> Let's go. <Yeah. laughs> Welcome to Dawa, ladies and gentlemen. Oh man! After having described his appearance as the most ideal, foreshadows his name, showing how he fulfills his name in Hebrew, "Vikulu Muhammadim," altogether desirable. Interestingly, this verse alludes to another prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in Haggai chapter two, where the desire of all nations shall come. And in the very next verse, chapter six, verse one, it says, "Where is the beloved gone that we may seek him?" Alluding back to another prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, Malachi chapter three, verse one, where the Master whom you seek, the Messenger of the Covenant whom you desire, is suddenly coming to the temple. Oh, in verse goodness. two, says he is found where the balsam trees grow, alluding back to Psalms eighty-four, where a lawgiver is found in the valley of Baca.
It also mentions that he's pasturing his flock and gathering lilies, referring to... Guys, it, this is what I mean. If you've actually read read any of this stuff, you're looking at this going, is this guy serious? Is he this? Is he is he the dumbest person ever, or is does he know he's lying? That's what you're that's what you're thinking when you're seeing him go through these passages. If you are not familiar with any of these passages, in other words, if you're one of his TikTok fans, you're just going, "Wow, it says all that stuff. It says all that stuff there, and there are all these prophecies about Muhammad." When if you look at anything he's saying and you read it. You realize this is so absolutely insane. My goodness, man. I don't know what to do, man. Well, I mean, like, if it's, it's foreshadowing his name, it's still plural. So is it foreshadowing multiple Muhammads to come? And Haggai 2.7 doesn't use the word Mahmud. If this was foreshadowing Muhammad, why not just use Mahmud? Why use a different word? Okay, it's, it's actually about God filling the temple, his house, with glory. Since Muhammad came after the temple was destroyed, how can this be about Muhammad? Same with Malachi. Okay, this cannot be anything about Muhammad if it's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. These are about times when the temple would still be there, not times after it was destroyed. So again, you got to change the meaning. Temple now has to become something else. It can't be referring to the actual temple. Uh, it's got to be something else to make this be about Muhammad. But again, if, if Haggai 2.7 is about Muhammad, why not just use the word Mahmad there? They don't. Because it's not about him, and no commentator would say that unless you assume Islam and read it into the text. Um, yeah, and so notice, I mean, guys, it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Woman's talking about how she's got the hots for her husband. Muslims are so desperate to find Muhammad in the Bible because their prophet said it's there. So notice, if they don't find it there, then he's a false prophet which should be the conclusion that you should draw. He said it's there. We can't find it. It's not there. He's a false prophet. They can't say that, and therefore they have to find it. So what are they doing? Oh, here's Song of Solomon. What base? What Islamic basis do you have for even thinking that that is a revealed word of God? None from an Islamic perspective, but we'll go with it because it uses the word Mahmud. And then for years, for decades, they say that's the proof. And then that gets exposed as really, really stupid. And so now it's, <laughs> ah, it's allegorical. And using a name that sounds like Muhammad is kind of hinting at who's going to fulfill this. Is that, that's what he's saying, right? Yeah. Well, he's trying, look, look, look at Song of Solomon 6 too. He says it's talking about balsam trees. No, it isn't. Balsam trees aren't in there. It's a bed of spices. Um, and we know that because if he would have just looked in the chapter he just read from, verse 5 uh, 13 uses the same phrase, just not in plural, bed of spices. It's the exact same in Song of Solomon 6 2. This guy didn't bother to check. It's saying he's in a bed of spices. It's not saying balsam trees. And even if it was saying balsam trees, balsam trees grow in Canaan. They grow throughout Judea. Like they don't just grow in Mecca. Like this is a ridiculous assertion. Uh, you can see balsam trees mentioned in 2 Samuel 5 23. If Song of Solomon was actually saying balsam trees, it would use the same. A phrase you see in 2 Samuel 5, 23, but it doesn't because it doesn't say balsam trees. It's using the same phrase it uses in 5.13 of Song of Solomon, which this guy was just looking at but didn't bother to cross-reference. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I know you want to get I know you want to get to numbers, but we're, I'm actually going to go with what he said here. Then we'll watch the rest of the video, right. and then you could go where you want to go. Um, but notice what he's saying. He's saying, hey, by using this word that kind of sounds like Muhammad, he's hinting at who's going to be the fulfillment of this allegory and so on. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and grant that. Let's go ahead and grant that. The word Mahmud, it's like Muhammad. And whenever God uses the word Mahmud in scripture, he's trying to tell you something about Muhammad. Great. Okay. Hosea yeah. 9, 6. Hosea 9, 6, even if they escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them and Memphis will bury them. Their treasures of silver will be taken over by briars and thorns will overrun their tents. So everything's going to, their treasures are all going to be uh, worn down and overrun. Okay. The word treasures there, Mahmud. So Muhammad will be, will be taken over by briars and thorns will overrun his tents. So mm -hmm. that sounds like he's going to be under judgment. Lamentations 1, 10 to 11. The enemy laid their hands on all her treasures. The word treasures there? Mahmud. <laughs> the enemy laid their hands on Muhammad. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary, those you had forbidden to enter your assembly. 
All her people groan as they search for bread. They barter their Muhammad for food. They're trading Muhammad for food to keep themselves alive. Look, Lord, and consider, for I am despised. Lamentations 2, 4. Like an enemy, he has strung his bow. His right hand is ready. Like a foe, he has slain all who are pleasing to the eye. That's Muhammad. Pleasing there is Muhammad. Muhammad. <laughs> like a foe, he has slain all who are Muhammad to the eye. Anyone who, who resembles Muhammad is getting slain. He has poured out his wrath like fire on the tent of the daughter of Zion. But that means Muhammad. Second Chronicles 36, 19. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. Value is Muhammad. It's Mahmud. It says Mahmud. Destroyed everything, Muhammad there. Everything that had anything to do with Muhammad, destroyed. So what's what's happened? What's happened? Everything that has anything to do with Muhammad's being destroyed. Ezekiel 24, 16. Son of man, with one blow I am about to take away from you the delight of your eyes. Yet do not lament or weep or shed any tears. Delight of your eyes there, delight is Mahmud. I'm about to ta take away the Muhammad of your eyes. Now, in context, this is referring to Ezekiel's wife. So Ezekiel's wife is called Mahmud. Ezekiel's well, wife is Mahmud. Well, this is clearly a good allegorical prophecy of Muhammad because didn't he wear his his wife's clothes at times? Yeah, he, yeah. So he was a Muhammad was a time traveling transgendered uh, wife of Ezekiel. <laughs> Muhammad he used to prance around in his child bride's nighty. He got carried away. He jumped on his flying donkey monster, who could not only just take him to Jerusalem, but was also a, a time traveling donkey monster. <laughs> since the temple in Jerusalem wasn't even there, so he must have traveled into the future. And then after he traveled in the future, he traveled in the past where he married Ezekiel and Muhammad was the woman in that relationship, according to our Muslim friends on TikTok. It hints to his name. How can you deny it? Yeah, two more. Say to the people of Israel, Ezekiel 24, 21, say to the people of Israel, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm about to desecrate my sanctuary, the stronghold in which you take pride, the delight of your eyes, the object of your affection. The word delight there, Mahmud. God says, God says he's going to desecrate Muhammad. He's God says he's going to desecrate Muhammad. And then, of course, Ezekiel 24, 25. And you, son of man, on the day I take away their stronghold, their joy and glory, the delight of their eyes, their heart's desire, and the sons and daughters as well. So here again, God is a delight of their eyes there. That is Muhammad. He's going to take away. Muhammad. He's going to desecrate Muhammad. He's going to take away and desecrate Muhammad. Guys, if if the word Muhammad is some sort of hint as to what God is going to do with Muhammad, there are all these passages about God destroying and desecrating Muhammad and, and destroying everything that has anything to do with Muhammad. So if you want to if you want to interpret the if you want to interpret this Song of Solomon allegorically and then say hey when you see the word Mahmud that's telling you something about what God's going to do with Muhammad okay then God's saying he's going to declare war on anything having to do with Muhammad that's that's the that's the takeaway conclusion there all right shall we finish up this video and then we want to look at numbers twenty two let's work? do it it works his followers and gathering the righteous remnant of Israel, whereas Christians would read it as Christ gathering the people for his church. So as we can see, his reputation did not deal with the prophecy whatsoever. It only focused on verse 16 and whether it should be translated as he is Muhammad, which I... No, shame on you. You only dealt with the normal <laughs> standard version of the argument that we've been hearing for three decades now. Agree, exactly. it shouldn't be. We can see this song acts as a kind of glue alluding to different biblical prophecies of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even foreshadowing his name and showing how he fulfills his name in Hebrew, altogether desirable. In an effort to counteract this, Christian apologists simply throw everything under the bus and they make the Song of Songs out to be nothing more than an erotic love poem with no deeper meaning because they know the second they admit the allegory, the Muslims are going to have a field day with them. Yes, all the Christians oh and Jews God. for centuries have just been like, who've been interpreting it as allegorical, have just not known how to deal with this such powerful argument from Muslims. Be, and they, they all converted to Islam, I guess, because it was just so obvious that when you start looking at it as allegorical, you just have to become a Muslim, apparently. 
This is so stupid. Think about, I mean, my goodness, what he just said there. <laughs> there we're, we're being forced to interpret it as just love poetry, which is the dominant position from the 19th century on. Uh, we're being forced to interpret that because once we, if we acknowledge it, it's allegorical, we're going to say, oh, it says Mahmoud there. That must be referring to Muhammad. And oh, it says he's outstanding among 10,000. That must, that can only refer to the, the big army of 10,000 that Muhammad had when he, when he attacked Mecca. It's the only thing those things could, that's the only thing those things could refer to. Hey, 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 hang on, hang on. <laughs> I know you want to go to numbers. Let, 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 let me just, <laughs> let me just use this method one more time. I can't help go myself, man. You ready? Mm -hmm. Solomon's Solomon's beloved is sitting there saying, wow, this guy is so hot. He's outstanding among 10,000. This guy says, yeah, that's referring to him being the military boss of an army of 10,000. That's the only thing that can say. And they'll do this whenever they see 10,000 up. Oh, this is this is a prophecy of Muhammad. Uh, because it, it said when he was going out to Mecca that he had an army of 10,000. Of course, at different times, he had different sized armies. So any number that was given, you could have said, oh, that's referring to that. Uh, check this out. Leviticus 26, 8. Let me read this as a modern Muslim da'i. <laughs> Five of you will chase 100 and 100 of you will chase 10,000. Oh, my goodness. This is talking about 10,000. 10, this is referring to Muhammad's army of 10,000. Oh, my goodness. It's the truth. It's the truth. It's the true prophecy. Deuteronomy 33, 17. In majesty, he is like a firstborn bull. His horns are like the horns of a wild ox. With them, he will gore the nations, even those at the end of the earth. Such are the ten thousands of Ephraim. Oh my goodness, it says ten thousands. That's got to be a reference to Muhammad and his army attacking Mecca. It's the only thing it can be. Judges 1, 4. When Judah attacked, the Lord gave the Canaanites and Perizzites into their hands, and they struck the ten thousand men of Israel. Oh my goodness, it says ten thousand men. This has to be Muhammad. This is the only thing it can possibly refer to. Judges 3.29, at, the, at that time they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, 10,000 Moabites, what could this possibly be referring to? Oh my goodness, there's nothing that the, the number 10,000 can refer to if it's not Muhammad. She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam from Kadesh, and not to lie, and said to them, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go take with you 10,000 men, oh my goodness, it's 10,000 men, this could only refer to Muhammad, it's the only possibility, it's the only thing it could ever be. Uh, Judges 7.3, now announced to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may, fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left. Well, 10,000 remain, 10,000 remain. Those are the ones who went with Muhammad. This is the only thing that can be. This is the proof, the proof that Islam is true. <laughs> Judges 20, 20, verse 34. Then 10,000 of Israel's able young men will frontal attack. Oh, give me, oh my goodness, it said 10,000. What, 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 what are the odds? It has to be Muhammad. It's the only possible prophecy fulfillment ever. In 1 Samuel 15, 4. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Tulane, 200,000 foot soldiers. 10,000 from Judah. Oh my goodness, 10,000 from Judah. This can all, this is the only, only possibility that this refers to 10,000 of Muhammad. Oh my goodness. Wait, wait, there's more? Second Samuel 18, 3. But the men said, you must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. If Even if half of us die, they won't, but you are worth 10,000 of us. Oh my goodness, it says 10,000. Anytime the number 10,000 is used, this can only refer to Muhammad. First Kings 5, 14. He sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of 10,000 a month. Oh my goodness, 10,000 is 10,000 going at a time, just like Muhammad's army, 10,000. They came to Mecca. Second Kings 13, 7. Nothing had been left in the army of Jehoahaz except 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. Oh my goodness, Muhammad went to Mecca with 10,000 foot soldiers. This is the clear proof. Guys, um, how many times do we need to see that? Oh my goodness. Second Kings 14, 7. He was the one who defeated 10,000 Edomites. Oh my goodness, those are the, those are the same people. It's just like Muhammad. Guys, uh, <laughs> Second Kings Keep 24. Doing this forever. I mean, <laughs> he carried all Jerusalem into exile. All the officers and fighting men, and the skilled workers and artisans. A total of ten thousand. Wait a minute, that's the exact number of people that Muhammad showed up to Mecca with. How how could this be anything other than a clear prophecy of Muhammad? No, notice, notice what they what their method would be. Seems to be pretty common in the Old Testament. Say ten thousand of this, ten thousand of that, ten thousand in the army, ten thousand here, ten thousand there. What they would do is they would search. They would do a search. And back in the day, it would have been with a concordance. Now we have computers. But it would have been a concordance. They would look for every time 10,000 is used. And then they would go through all the references where it says 10,000. They would look for anyone that could fit somehow with Muhammad. If you it completely ignored everything else it's about. And then they run out. Look, it says 10,000. But Muhammad, Muhammad uh, came, to, came at Mecca with 10,000. So you see it's a prophecy. And if you're talking to people who've never read the passage and who trust you because they don't know that you're a liar, you fall for it. And that's Dawah. Mm -hmm. That's Dawah. That's been Dawah for decades.
Well, luckily, we can use our own methodology to show that Muhammad is clearly in Numbers 22. I can, can show you right where it, it's clearly a typological prophecy that there's going to be a prophet coming from outside of Israel, because that's kind of what it's going over. Balaam is in that chapter. Well, I'm going to be the judge of this, and I'm going to decide whether you have <laughs> used their method uh, appropriately. I got to see All this. Right. Here we have it. Numbers 22. Well, you got to go down to, I believe, starting in verse... Uh, 26 all the way down to 26 yeah we're scrolling through when, the proof we're scrolling through so, the I mean, proof this is proof right here that you can have a prophet outside of israel because balaam is a prophet who's not of israel and he is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. riding his donkey to pronounce judge to give a prophecy and judgment over israel and Powerful. the angel of the lord went ahead and stood in a narrow place where he was no there was no way to turn either to the right or the left when the donkey saw the angel she lay down under balaam so she bowed she bowed. The donkey actually bowed. Okay. Nice. And Balaam's anger was kindled and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and the donkey spoke to Balaam. What have I done to you that you have struck me with these three times? Now, clearly the ass in this passage is Muhammad because the angel opens the mouth of the ass, just like oh, Gabriel opens the mouth of Muhammad. I know. So the talking ass in this is Muhammad. And look, Balaam is bringing her uh, from outside of Israel to come into Israel, like Muhammad eventually, like eventually the Muslims came and took over the region of Israel. Also, notice what the donkey says in this passage. The Lord opened the mouth of the donkey. And she, said, she said, what have I done to you that you have struck me with these times? Okay, remember, M M weren't the Meccans pagans and they were persecuting Muhammad? Mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm. Same thing. The Balaam said to the donkey, because you have made a fool of me. I wish I had my sword in hand and I would kill you. The Meccans wanted to kill Muhammad because they, Muhammad made a fool of them with his sick rat beats or um, revelations, whatever, uh, that came down from Allah. And they, he, he made a fool with his beautiful poetry and they wanted to kill him. So clearly Balaam, who is a pagan outside of Israel, is this is a typological prophecy of him persecuting the talking ass here showing you that this is clearly talking about the coming of Muhammad. A talking ass will be given revelations from an angel. The mouth of the talking ass will be opened by the angel and he will speak and the pagans will persecute this person. They will want to kill him because of how beautiful his revelations are. Can I get an amen? Now, to be clear, did you just prove conclusively using the exact same methodology that our Dawah friends use, that Muhammad is Balaam's talking ass. <laughs> Absolutely, I did. I mean, how could you deny it? I mean, again, it's a pagan persecuting the talking ass, just like Muhammad was persecuted. An angel of the Lord opening the mouth of the talking ass? Clearly, it's a reference to Gabriel. Dude. I mean, the same thing. It's clearly there, just like in Deuteronomy 33. How could you not see it? Yeah, and, and matter of fact, we could just give a, a bunch of references to donkey or something like that from the Bible and show that these are, are all about Muhammad. So did everyone yeah, catch that? Donkey, oh, and the donkey lays down, like prostrating itself, like the Muslims do at, at, when they go to, mm -hmm. um, it prostrated. when they pray. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there you go. This is all about Muhammad. It's, he is the talking ass here. And uh, I mean, think about all the interesting parallels. So Muhammad is Balaam's talking ass. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they'll, they'll be like well it, it says she it says she but remember ezekiel said uh that muhammad was the delight of his eyes so clearly in that passage it's referring to muhammad as a she same thing can happen to me in numbers 22 there you go mahmad in numbers 22 or um, in this it's not in numbers 22 but it's in ezekiel referring to a she so there you go it fits right as well but notice muhammad was Balaam's talking ass. Muhammad said the eyes are the leather strap of the anus. <laughs> so you have it all there. you got a leather strap. You know, you've got a leather strap yeah. for your donkey. I don't know, man. It's pretty airtight. I have to say, I have to say, you made as good a case that Muhammad is actually Balaam's talking ass <laughs> as I have ever seen any Muslim make a case for Muhammad in the Bible. That's at that's at your 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 you're arguing the exact same way they argue 
but proving that Muhammad is uh, <coughs> is Balaam's talking ass. You, you can't deny it. An angel opens his mouth. Uh, the donkey lays down like it's praying. I mean, like, and then it's persecuted by a pagan that wants to kill him for the words that the donkey has said. How can you deny this? We now have an airtight case that Muhammad is a talking donkey. <laughs> Convinced I am. I certainly am. I'm using the same Dawah method that they use for like Deuteronomy. That's, a, that's, exact, so that's exactly that's that's exactly the method they use. We, guys, we're, we're not exaggerating. It's let's look for anything that could sound like any sort of parallel, no matter how ridiculous, with Muhammad and say, you see, this is the proof. That's what they do. Okay, fine. We can use the exact same method to prove that Muhammad is Balaam's talking ass. <laughs> Hope you all learned something. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the status of, and here's what's crazy. This guy's obviously putting a lot more work into the argument from Song of Solomon than Muslims of the past did. Right? They just, well, oh, Mahmud, that sounds like Muhammad. Mahmud, Muhammad, Mahmud, Muhammad. Yeah, you see, this is the proof. And now they have the 2.0 version, which is uh, just put a bunch of just put a bunch of passages up on the screen and hope, hope that your followers don't bother to look at what you're look closely at what you're saying, because guess what? They aren't. And you can you can you can all go to the, the comment section of that TikTok video. Watch. I guarantee his Muslim fans are going, oh, wow. Wow. You just destroyed the Christians on this one. You just destroyed inspiring philosophy. Oh, wow. Because we don't know anything you just said. We don't understand anything you just quoted to us. We don't know how, how, how absolutely stupid you sound to anyone who's bothered to read anything you're talking about. Um, and, and again, ladies and gentlemen, that's Dawah. It's finding people who don't know any better telling them a bunch of stuff they want to hear and trying to to reinforce people's belief in Muhammad so fast that they never bother to look anything up. That's the methodology. Yeah. And for everyone who's, yeah, I'm so glad he didn't try to argue that Mahmudim is a plural of respect because that doesn't exist in Hebrew. There's no names made plural out of respect in Hebrew. So again, if it's a hint to his name, it's referring to multiple Muhammads at this point. Uh, there's no Yahweh'im. They'll try to use Elohim, but Elohim is a concretized abstract plural. It's like the English word sheep. You could speak of one sheep or many sheep. No scholar today thinks Elohim is a plural of respect because we don't see Yahweh'im or Solomon'im or David. It just doesn't exist in Hebrew. There is no plural of respect in Hebrew, even though, what was it, Ahmed Didat made that argument like years ago and Muslims just ran with it mm. without evidence. Like it, It's absurd. Yeah, that's uh, and that's the goal of sort of I mean, it's hard work because, uh, again, the method is Ahmed Dida and Zakir Naik, all these guys worked on what I call Islam's 99-1 rule. And uh, the 99-1, that's being generous. But the, the rule is they've always understood if you're talking to people and you, you make something up, out of 100 people, probably 99 are just going to mindlessly agree with you. And maybe one of the one person goes and looks it up. But the 99 can can shame and silence that person, right? How dare you? How dare you challenge the great Ahmed Didat? How dare you contradict Zakir Naik? Who do you think you are, right? Or even worse, they can just kill you over it, right? But uh, notice that's being generous because the fact is, if Zakir Naik had 100,000 people watching, if they were all Muslims, if he had 100,000 people watching, how many of those are actually going to go look up what he says? Maybe 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 one, maybe one out of a hundred thousand, maybe, right? Um, so notice notice if you once you've developed that kind of crowd where you can say anything and they'll just run with it, and you can just say, hey, the word the word there is Mahmudim, and that's the plural of, uh, is talking about Muhammad, and that's a prophecy about Muhammad. His name's right there. If all your fans just run around sharing that, and almost no one is refuting it. Guess what? You can spread that nonsense to millions and millions and millions and millions of people before it gets refuted. And why do we keep refuting it? Because, again, it takes a long, long time. Eventually, some people start catching on. And what we're looking for, we're looking for a, a light switch moment when the followers of Zucker Nike and Ahmed Didat and these other guys all finally realize, wait a minute. 
Why do our arguments keep changing every couple of years? Why do we need the 2.0 version of all these arguments? Uh, it's because the original was made up, but it spread so fast that we all agreed to it. And now we still need to cling to it. And so we need to come up with a 2.0 version. Well, I think we just need to start employing the Dawa method and use it on like numbers 22, that Muhammad is clearly the talking ass. No, no, you no need, other you, way to get around you it. You need to make a video titled Muhammad was Balaam's talking ass. Or if you're worried about, you know, <laughs> YouTube censors call it Muhammad was uh, Balaam's talking donkey. 100 yes. and then 100 percent proof in the. Uh... <laughs> yep, that's where we're at now. If we're going to if they're going to keep using this method with Song of Solomon, I'm going to use the same method to say he's clearly mentioned in, song, mm -hmm. in Numbers 22 as the talking ass. I'm just same thing, same method they're doing, just looking for these vague associations and running wild with it. Powerful stuff, powerful stuff. Um, quick comment from the Super Chat. Myron says, uh, hey, David, as a Messianic Jew, my question to you for Islam is when it comes to debating with Muslims, what would be the best evidences from the Tanakh, let alone the gospel? that is against Islam. Uh, well, yeah, if you're going to the gospel, you have some very clear stuff. You can just go with Jesus, death, resurrection, and deity and show how these things contradict Islam. I, I can give him some. Are you talking about from the Tanakh or from the gospel? About the Tanakh. So from the yeah. Tanakh, so the, uh, I pointed this out before. If you look in the Old Testament, it's, it's very ambiguous in the Psalms and in Exodus if the Pharaoh d drowned in the Red Sea or not it leaves open the possibility that he did not because in Exodus 14, it says the Egyptians turned and fled because their wheels were getting stuck. So it says that, you know, it, it as scholars like David Falk, James Hoffmeyer, Kenneth Kitchen, uh, across the board of acknowledge, Exodus doesn't say the Pharaoh actually drowned in the Red Sea. It's ambiguous. It could go either way. We know from archeological evidence, the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Ramesses II. He didn't drown in the Red Sea. He lived long into his old age, okay? And, I've seen Muslims even argue this too. As is well. is they that the? That by the way, is that the is that the guy who was like all messed up? Ramesses? No, I mean like like when they they did an they did an I think it was no, him. Too to common. Too to common. No, they didn't. They do it. Didn't they do an autopsy and found out he was he was suffering from a like a horrible um um um. Most of the pharaohs did because they were all inbred. Yeah, that when I when I read about him, it was uh, it he didn't sound like someone who was riding around in a horse in his old age and died uh, charging. He sounded like he was all old and messed up. He was. He's pretty decrepit in his old age. Okay, but the Quran is clear. It says the Pharaoh of the Exodus drowned in the Red Sea. That's historically that's a historical error. Okay, it we have no evidence that any pharaohs from the New Kingdom ever died by drowning in the Red Sea. Uh, and again, the Bible is ambiguous on this. It leaves open yes or no. It doesn't really matter. So there's something you can use against the Quran because it gets that as an historical error. The other one is that it says that the Jews say that Ezra is the son of God. There's nowhere in the Tanakh where they say that Ezra is the son of God. That's just another error. Um, yeah, so if I were if I were pulling, uh, I, I would go, if I were going with the Tanakh, I would go to some of the passages that refer to God as as the father to his people. Because in the Quran, Allah is a father to no one, mm -hmm. and so uh, I would, I would, I would go to some of those passages. Look, here's 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 uh, God referred to as a father, and then passages in the Quran which say that that Allah is a father to no one. There is no one who approaches him as anything other than a slave. Um, but yeah, it, you don't have to you don't have to go far. You could you could pretty much go to any story about Abraham or Moses or something like that in the Quran and go to the parallel story in the Bible and find disagreements and discrepancies. And so the Muslims would be forced to say, ah, that's been corrupted. But guess what? Their, their God and their prophet didn't believe that it's been corrupted. In fact, according to Surah 10, verse 94, if Muhammad's revelations don't line up with ours, it means his aren't the word of God. That's how strongly the Quran affirms that the people of the book had reliable scripture when Muhammad was having doubts about his revelations, keep in mind, this is a guy who once thought he was demon possessed when he started receiving revelations. He had doubts along the way. Um, when Muhammad had doubts, Allah says, go to the people of the book and make sure your revelations line up with theirs. Well, if we got a corrupt book, you got a problem because then you'd say in order for your book to be true, it would have to line up with a corrupt book. That doesn't make any sense. 
Um, so notice what Allah is saying. If your book doesn't line up with theirs, so much for your revelations, Muhammad. That's what the Quran says. So you can find it. So you can find all kinds of things. Um, I, I I do like going into the uh, into the passages where God is uh, uh, God is our heavenly Father. Mm. And one more here from Scarlett. Hi, David. Slightly off topic. Asked earlier. Uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, Jesus was either a liar, insane, or telling the truth. Some uh, Islam teachers accept the resurrection but not divinity. So why would God resurrect a liar or insane guy? You do have to, you do have to flesh out that argument a bit because um, you do have the possibility of things being made up. And so you have to clarify why that is not open to Muslims. So what you say is, in other words, you, you, you have to build, you have to build up to using this. You, you show, Hey, your book, the Quran, affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of my book. That's why you guys run around trying to find prophecies about Muhammad in my book. Your book affirms my book. But in my book, which your book and your prophet affirm, uh, Jesus dies on the cross, he rose from the dead, and he is Lord. So yes, the, the, the vast majority of Muslims do not believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. You do have some, like Ismaili, uh, Muslims uh, who believe that Jesus uh, was uh, crucified and so on. You'll, you'll find you will find Muslims who believe that Jesus died and, and was raised, uh, but not the not the divinity. And so all you have to do is show any passage from the uh, from the Gospels where Jesus is making claims that he should not be making if he's merely a human prophet, and then they have to say it's been corrupted. And then you say. So it's it doesn't, your book says it's not corrupted. Your book says it can't be corrupted. And so you're putting them in this dilemma. Go ahead. It's also very easy to show that Jesus is God in, in the gospels, because just go to John. It opens by saying he's God, the first mm -hmm. verse. Uh, and then John eight fifty eight before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you go to Psalm 92 in the Septuagint, which is written in Greek, it says, and from everlasting to everlasting, you are. Now, if you look at that phrase, you are in the Greek, that is basically second person of what Jesus says in first person in John 8, 58. It, it's, it's word for word, first person, the second person right there. You are, Psalm 90, Septuagint, John 8, 58, I am. So Jesus is directly saying that he is Yahweh of the Old Testament. It's very clear right there because you can see the direct comparison from you are to I am in the Greek. So I would use that very easily. And then, of course, at the end of John, Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He says that he is his God. So right there, same as well. Um, not interested in this comment from Lowell because he's a troll, but he keeps asking, um, where do you have evidence that the Messiah would be divine? A uh, bunch of bunch of things, but you could go to one that Jesus used used himself. So Psalm one ten is a messianic psalm, and it says, "The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies uh, your footstool." So the Lord said to my Lord, and Jesus brings this up. Jesus brings this up in the Gospels. He says. You know, David's king, and he's calling the Messiah Lord. How is how is the Messiah just a you know a, a merely human descendant of David if David is calling him his Lord? And so that is a messianic psalm that Jesus himself used to show that he is not a merely human prophet as Islam claims. And so what are you gonna do? Say Jesus got it wrong. Oh, the gospel's been corrupted. That's why it says that, because the gospel's been corrupted. Really? Well, your God and your prophet say that Allah revealed the Torah and the gospel, and that no one can change Allah's words, and he uh, tells Christians that we have to judge by the gospel. So if the gospel says that Jesus is Lord, and the Quran says that Jesus is not Lord, guess who wins? According to your book, we judge by the gospel. Yep. I'm going to keep doing that. All right, guys. Uh, well, it is. Uh, we've been at this two hours, so we're going to close out now. And uh, thanks to IP for uh, going, spending all this time going through these TikToks. It's it's like, it, it, 
it's fun. it's depressing just i don't know it's kind of depressing even thinking about it. it's like we've been dealing with this mess on youtube for all these years and now there's this whole bigger mess forming on tiktok with people who are even more clueless and it's like i don't even want to get into that but you jumped into it so uh hats off <laughs> hats off to you for going there uh, yep i got a lot of good testimonies so i'm gonna keep going i got a lot of uh you know so i, I helped a couple muslims leave islam so i'm happy about that you know that's really awesome and um those of you who are watching, uh, keep that in mind. If you're young and you're deciding what you want to do in life, uh, you can follow IP's example and head over to TikTok and start responding to some of the stuff there. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of the best way is to kind of learn on the go. Go over there, find a video by one of these uh, Dawa guys and study it, study it and um, and make a response. And guess what? You're always, always, always going to find some problems in the argument. They're giving an argument for Muhammad, especially Muhammad in the Bible. You are always, 100% of the time, going to find that it's really, really stupid. So figure out what's stupid about it. Share what's stupid about it. And if enough people do do that, then we can end the reign of the Dawa, Dawa guys who follow the 99-1 method. Um, all right, everyone, be sure to subscribe to... Oh, I will. I did not add your... Uh, send me a, send me a link, send me a link to your TikTok channel. I will add that, uh, to the description so that anyone who's watching this later, or if you're all watching, uh, uh, just check five minutes from now, if you don't have, um, IP's TikTok channel and you're on TikTok, then you want to check that out. Um, other than that, be sure to subscribe to them on YouTube. And again, I will have the link up in a few, in a few minutes for, yeah, I just his TikTok put it in the guest chat. So you got it. All right. So. We'll catch you all next time, wherever the Dawa guys are lying about Muhammad in the Bible. We'll be there. It's hard work, but someone's got to do it.